Today's episode of Something to Wrestle With is brought to you by our friends at Ageless Mail Max because these guys have a patent pending formula, Bruce, that has an ingredient that helps you boost your total testosterone and it's going to promote greater increases in muscle size and twice the reduction in body fat percentage than exercise alone. It also boasts an amazing 64% in nitric oxide, which can be handy in the gym and the bedroom, Bruce. Tell everybody how they can take advantage of this offer. Well, all you got to do is take your manhood to the max and try your first 30-day bottle for free. That's right. All you got to do is pay shipping and handling. And we're not talking 10 days, 5 days, 15 days, 20 days. No, an entire full 30-day supply free, absolutely free, when you text the word SLAM, S-L-A-M, to 797979. Finally, man, a formula that is going to keep you from feeling sluggish and boost your total testosterone. And if your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, just increase the use. For your free bottle, text SLAM, S-L-A-M, to 797979. That SLAM to 797979. Message and data rates may apply. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With, but just barely. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? <laughs> what the hell? Go back and tell everybody what you said just before you said what it is that you said. So, I have to admit, <laughs> Bruce and I have been burning it at both ends lately. Me especially. Three fucking podcasts. Three Patrons. The WWE Network show. <laughs> Starcast. A wedding mortgages and um i'm worn out i'm not far from burnout and so as we're recording this it's literally the night before you hear it and it's very late at night especially when you've had the crazy schedule we have so we we recorded that pre-roll spot there for ageless male max and (laughs) then i went to open a new file and i clicked record and i just looked at bruce for a minute and i said hey how do I start the show again? I literally forgot to say, Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, which is something I've said in my mortgage career for our radio spots for like 10 years. And I lost it. And you started laughing hysterically and told me that you too haven't slept and you've been going at both ends. So this is going to be our most punch drunk episode ever. And we're drinking diet Coke. It, as I was going to say, I'm, I'm over here drinking diet Coke and water and, uh, yeah. So, if, if, yes, folks, we're drinking, by God. We're going to be hydrating a lot during this show, and um, it is what it is. So, hey, hey, I'm Bruce. Wait, no, that's your gift, right? I think right? that's my line. But your line oh. was reaching out to uh, fans who hit us up last week. Believe it or not, when we covered SummerSlam 1997, which was such a fun show, we talked about 12-year-old Ryan Chad Dick, and he was one of the sweepstakes winners. And I was joking about... Um, his name and how roll tied sunny was and then we got a surprise this week right bruce yeah because he reached out on twitter and he contradicts your well he didn't contradict your roll tied sunny however he said that even not winning that the prize for him at 12 years old was the hug from sable and how in his own words now who he's an avid listener so thank you ryan was that that made it all worth it just to be next to sable and that she was the roll tide one that night no no old chadick was a loser that night and he's he's wrong now because uh he's not wrong because he's a fan no i understand thanks for listening ryan but you're wrong (laughs) Uh, i'm allowed to say that and and the internet agrees with me sunny was at her most roll tide in SummerSlam 97 but you had some fun interactions with fans this past week and you told me this off air And I laughed and laughed and laughed, and I need you to share. Well, man, I I had to get away. I had to unplug. It it had been a month. I think I was home a day and a half in July. And I just wanted to unplug. And a buddy of mine and I went to Austin, Texas this past week. And while we were there, we we had just kind of blew off some steam. And I went to the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. Uh, to see the the Iceman, the Minnesota Iceman, a real famous deal. And they had, now I'm not being out of line here, I, it's called the Freak Show. And the Freak Shows are, are outlawed in a lot of places. But I got to meet the Black Scorpion. 
Black Flair. Okay, I don't wait. even know what the hell his real name is. Hang on. Ric Flair was there? No, the real Black Scorpion, man. Oh, what was his name? Al Perez? Al Perez was there? No, the real Black Scorpion, man. He's got lobster claws for hands. Hey, I've got a picture on. of him on Twitter. Why are you talking about Ole Anderson that way? Uh, well, Ole's not getting around the good these days, but he doesn't have lobster hands. No, but the Black Scorpion does, and he's performing at the Museum of the Weird. So he finishes his performance, and I'm sitting right there in the front row, all right? He finished his performance, and before he lets everybody go, he goes, man, I just I can't contain myself anymore. i got to tell you, I'm a big fan of yours. I listen to the show every week, and the owner of the place here is a big fan of yours, and, and, and I, it's just such an honor to meet you. And he was great, and I got a picture there on Twitter for everybody to see. But I met the real Black Scorpion at the Museum of the Weird there in Austin, Texas. So if you get a chance and you're in the Austin area, go by and tell them Bruce sent you. Well, all right. I didn't expect to hear that, but, uh, what do you know? Uh, here's something else that I'm, I'm not expecting. I'm not expecting you to actually be here later today for wrestling con. Cause you're listening to this on August 10th and in Huntsville, Alabama tomorrow on August 11th, wrestling con is a real thing. Rocket city championship wrestling at the Von Braun civic center tickets are on Ticketmaster. Dude, it's at the Civic Center. Ticketmaster's there. The Road Warrior, uh, Jimmy Hart, The Goon, Tracy Smothers, Dr. D, and what do you know, Brother Freaking Love. Yeah, I'm doing a special Q&A at 4.30. I'm looking forward to it, and I uh, might even bring uh, Conrad Tom, Tom, Thompson. And, Jesus, am I punching? Am <laughs> I punching? I'm, I'm going to have that as a uh, shirt in about two weeks. I'm punching. I'm punching. Hey, you uh, know, somebody who will be punching tomorrow is friend of the show, Dale Jackson. He's a conservative talk show host here in Huntsville, Alabama, who's created what he calls the hate machine for over a decade. And from what I understand, he's actually going to make his wrestling debut, Bruce. I'm looking forward to seeing Dale and I'm going to be in Dale's corner. Maybe, maybe, you know what? Maybe I'll go out and be in Dale's corner and cheer him on. Oh, wait, hang on now. If I know anything about Bruce Pritchard, it's that you're going to shit on the new guy and you're going to tell him that everything was the shits and that he needs to stick to radio. Well, I'll definitely be honest with him, but I'd still at least like to be a ringside and be able to laugh at him. Yeah. <laughs> but you never know what's going to happen. Come to wrestling con here in Huntsville. I can't believe that's a real thing. And how about this next weekend? We're back in our home away from home, man, New York city. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but we confirmed another guest this week. Do you want to give them a hint or no? Nope. Nope. Not going to, this is going to be a show. People are going to be talking about it's Gramercy theater. As Bruce likes to say, believe it or not, there's like 10 VIPs left. You can snatch them up right now. We should remind you that you still have plenty of time to see our show and go to the NXT show. This is an afternoon show on Saturday at two o'clock. Uh, pick up your tickets right now at brucepritchard.com. We've also got San Antonio next month and uh, Nashville, of course, is sold out, but Boston still has tickets in October. How do we get tickets to the Boston show, Bruce? Lots of people are saying they're going to the site. They're not seeing it. How do they get tickets? Here's what you do. You go to brucepritchard.com, clip on.com, click on Boston. It's going to take you to the Kowloon site. Give Kowloon a call and they'll take your order the old fashioned way over the phone. Give me your credit card, pick up your tickets. Yes, it's not that they haven't caught up to us yet. However, Andy Wong and the folks over at Kowloon's are on top of it. All you got to do is give them a call to get your tickets, and it's as easy as that. From what I understand, Bruce, they've been doing this for shows for years and years and years. So this is just the way they do it, and Kowloon's knows how to make uh, a good meal and trust a fat guy when it comes to that. Come join us. Get your eat on. Get your laugh on. It's October in Boston. LA in November, and then we're going across the pond. We've got those shows on sale now for both Ireland, Scotland, and a handful of shows all across England. Get all your ticket information right now at brucepritchard.com. And Bruce, without further ado, let's talk about my childhood favorite, the immortal Hulk Hogan. Now we've covered Hogan 87 and Hogan 88. Both of those are in our archives. We've also done shows on uh, WrestleMania four. We covered WrestleMania um, 5 a little bit with the Mega Powers episode. We've also got WrestleMania 6 available in our archives, and we've even covered some of Zeus. So a lot of what we've got in 89 
we've already hit on. So we're going to touch on some of that stuff, but what we've done for you today is we added 1990, which in my opinion has one of the most underrated Hulk Hogan feuds of all time. And the interesting dynamic that we had with warrior as the supposed top guy with the world title, but Hogan's still hanging around because of earthquake. So let's get into it from the beginning. And I guess we should just talk about what a run you guys have had up until this point, man. Hulkamania was at a fever pitch in 1985 with rock and wrestling and WrestleMania. And then of course we keep the momentum going with sit with 86, but then 87, it feels like it hits a, a whole new plateau. It just a landmark night for wrestling in general with WrestleMania three, they pivot a little bit to WrestleMania four, which we've talked about was probably a bit of a miss, a bit of a letdown, but still hugely financially successful WrestleMania five, which happened in 89 is going to break all the records. But as we come into 1989, Hulk Hogan is not your champion. The macho man's your champion. You're building towards the biggest WrestleMania ever. You hope with WrestleMania five, and you're going to break up the mega powers. What was the relationship like at this time with Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon? And I ask because we know that Hogan is going to be debuting a movie. Of course he, he left in 88 to go film it, but the movie is going to come out here and be a huge success based on what original expectations probably were. And it feels like whenever someone leaves and sort of ventures out these days, it has a little bit of an effect on their relationship with Vince McMahon. What was that like here for Hulk Hogan in early 89? Yeah, they, Vince and Hulk were still tight here because this was pretty much a joint venture. This was a, a Vince production with the movie No Holds Barred, and it was his first foray into the movies in addition to Hulk being a leading man in the movie. So it was a Vince production, and it was an extension of that Hulk Hogan character onto the movie screen now. You'd already seen him in Rocky Three before that, but now you, it was a way to take that Hulk Hogan character that people knew in the wrestling ring and make it a little bit bigger. You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that it was a Vince McMahon production, but I mean, at this point did, I mean, were there discussions as far as you know, that you're a movie star now, pal. And I mean, we know that, that Vince got into movies and certainly had a fascination with movies and that whole process. But in this point, were there aspirations of trying to make Hulk Hogan like the next Arnold Schwarzenegger? I mean, did, did Vince have the, uh, Spaldings as Russo would say to think that he could do that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that both Vince felt that Hulk was that guy that could step up and fill that role. And Hulk also felt that way. So yeah, this was the first foray. You go back and look at Schwarzenegger's first movie, which I guess was Conan the Barbarian. He maybe said three words and it was God awful, horrible, but it was an entry into Schwarzenegger being a, the idol and big action hero star that he became later on. Well, the big star that Hulk Hogan was looking for is the big boss man. He's working the house show loops with him to start 89. And then we get right into the Royal rumble, January 15th, Houston, Texas. Hulk comes in at number 18 and he eliminates Mr. Perfect. Both of the bushwhackers. Bad News Brown, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, Randy Savage, Coco Beware, Warlord, and Big Boss Man before he is eventually eliminated by the Twin Towers. And the Twin Towers are going to eliminate him together. And then from the outside, Hulk's going to pull down the top rope and Boss Man goes over eliminating him. So chat me up here. We've sort of joked about this for a while. It does sort of feel like even Babyface Hulk Hogan's still doing some heel shit here, is he not? I mean, he's eliminated. But he's eliminating someone else even after he's on the floor. God, you know, it's it's funny when you look back and you look at the traditional baby faces. And I guess what we try to portray in the picture that we try to paint of what a baby face is, is that they never cheat. They're red, white and blue and that they're altruistic all of the time. However, the strongest baby faces had those heel tendencies and they, they cheated when they had to and they they did things that were not what I think a lot of bookers would consider and a lot of traditionalists would consider true baby faces. And Hulk Hogan could get away with it. Uh, it just used to astound me 
because just like you said, man, it's like he gets eliminated. He's eliminated. He's out of the fucking match. But yet he, he eliminates people and they count it. It's Hulk Hogan, man. It's OK. Just pay no attention. Nothing to see here. I realize that I'm a JCP apologist sometimes, but it does feel a little weird here that Hulk Hogan eliminates Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. I don't know why. Why? Why not? I guess because he also eliminated both Bushwhackers. Well, see, there you go. Know, that's big. Hey, listen, there. I'd really get like to, than that. I'd really like to not start a fight with you right now, but if you're about to compare Arn and Tully to the fucking Bushwhackers. That's true because there really is no comparison. I don't know that Arn and Tully could really hold up against the Bushwhackers and the Sheep Herders, by God. If you want to compare if you want to compare total careers, then <laughs> why are you looking at me like that, man? It's freaking me out. You're like that mean little girl. I'm not gonna let you sit here and disparage the good goddamn name of Arn Anderson. What about Tully? That's okay, I guess. Okay. Well, I mean, the word, I don't know Tully. I mean, he seems like a nice enough guy, but Aaron Anderson, come on. All right. So let's talk about the actual storyline here in this match. Of course, I mentioned Hogan eliminates Savage and they're supposed to be the mega powers. Uh, Savage ain't having that shit. He gets right back in the ring, gets in Hulk's face. And that leads to Elizabeth coming down and getting between them. Of course they make up, but we're still planting the seeds of the eventual split of the mega powers. And you know, it's funny. Because I went back and I watched SummerSlam 88 this week because I know that we're going to be covering that very soon here on the podcast later this month, actually. And I wanted to just go ahead and get it out of the way because I knew it'd be doing some traveling and I made my notes and yada, yada, yada. But it's funny that at the time I missed it. But when I watched it there, I mean, again, for the first time in, I don't know, forever, Macho man goes up to celebrate the win in one corner and Liz comes over to get his attention. He shoes her away. She goes back over and Hogan picks her up, spins her around, is holding her in his arm. And then macho man gets down and just looks really weird. And it's just a, a, a faint expression. And he puts his arms out like, what the fuck is this? And then eventually, you know, he comes around and it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but just for a minute. If you knew what to look for, it was there, but every other time I've watched it, I didn't see it. So this thing is still probably one of the best storylines you guys ever had. Let's talk about the main event. It's next. It's February 3rd, 89. We've got the mega powers and the twin towers. This is the famous match where the mega powers broke up. We covered this on the WWE network in great detail. Savage is thrown from the ring by Akeem. He falls onto Elizabeth, knocks her unconscious. Uh, and then the whole angle in the back with, um, Hogan asking for a countdown on live TV and he's concerned about Liz and he gets nailed with the big title, uh, still probably one of the most memorable main events uh, as far uh, even a Saturday night's main event. This is one of the biggest NBC shows ever. Is it not? Yes, it definitely was. And I, I also remember when you go back and watch it how clean it looked. And, and I guess that's looking at it from a production standpoint, but I just remember how beautifully lit and how clean everything looked that night on TV. Um, Dick Ebersol, as I've said before, uh, I've learned so much from Ebersol through the years, as far as television goes. Um, but this was also a night where I learned a lot of things not to do with Dick and, and Dick was, uh, you know, Dick was everywhere, but, uh, what did you learn not to do with Dick? I, I learned not to let people do things that they didn't know what the hell they were doing. And I learned, so I learned to speak. Up. I learned to speak up. So if you're not comfortable with what someone's doing with their dick, you should speak up. Yes, you should. Okay. Definitely. You should speak up. And, and what I'm referring to is that I really should have, uh, I felt I really should have produced the, backstage scene with Hogan and Liz in the, in the room and Ebersol felt that he should. And I didn't fight for it because, because Dick assured me he had it and, and he didn't. So, well, let's talk. I got yelled at later for not speaking up. After that, uh, Hogan's working the house show loops with boss man. And that gets us to the Saturday night's main event where Hulk worked a match with bad news Brown. And of course, Hogan goes over there that goes down in Hershey PA on February 16th. 
talk to me about bad news. Brown. We haven't talked about him much here on the show. We've touched on him a little bit here and there, but why wasn't he a prime top opponent for Hulk Hogan? He was, he, he worked all over with Hulk. He had a hell of a program with, with Hogan back in the day when he first came in, he worked all around the loop with Hogan. What was Hogan's perception of him? I, from my recollection, he loved working with bad news because he was a big guy. He was believable and he was a great worker. So they got along. Um, bad news. Allen <laughs> was a legit tough son of a bitch, but they got along well and they had a hell of a run around the horn. Uh, let's talk about, um, what the, the perception of the boys was with bad news Brown, because I think, and we've touched on this before that he had an incident with Andre, the giant once upon a time beyond that. And that's in our archive, something to wrestle.com. Were there any other interesting bad news, Brown stories besides the Piper WrestleMania thing. And then the whole Andre took a dump on him thing. You know, there was a uh, incident in, I want to say we were, we might've been in Calgary, but we were in Northwest. Uh, we might've been in Canada, but we also might've just been in, in like Seattle or somewhere up in there. And there was a guy by the name of the Cuban assassin. And I, I saw it happen, but I didn't know what was happening. And all of a sudden bad news was in this guy's face and was telling him off. And before you know it, there were uh, chairs thrown and, and a few fists that were thrown and Cuban assassin reached in his bag and pulled out a, a big knife and uh, everybody got in between them. But it was apparently an old grudge or an old dispute from years before in Calgary. And this, I don't think the bad news had seen Cuban assassin up until this point and bad news went up. And when the guy pulled the knife, took the knife out of his bag, uh, Alan didn't back down an inch that may have, you know, really infuriated him more than anything. But I remember we were sitting there and we, I was having a conversation with somebody else and looked over and you see chairs being thrown and backstage, you never really know if you're shooting, somebody shooting something or if something else is going on. And it didn't take long to realize, okay, no, this is a bad scene and people got in between them and. And, uh, the Cuban assassin left shortly thereafter. Well, there you go. Uh, let's talk about WrestleMania five, uh, on our way here. It's all boss man on the house shows again, before we talk about five, because we have talked about it before. I do want to ask, um, boss man, where does he rank for Hogan opponents? Do you think don't say fucking top five. Uh, uh, honest, honestly, really and truly, I would put him in the top five. I would put boss man up there because he was a big bumping, unselfish guy that was able to do it all with Hogan. And he was able to go back and, and have many returns with Hulk and still, and draw money on those returns. I would put, you know, you got Andre, you got Savage, um, you got earthquake and I would throw, I would really throw boss man up in there as far as a, a big heel that Hogan enjoyed working with, you know, you got Piper and I'm probably leaving a lot of guys out, but boss man was excellent. Let's talk about, um, WrestleMania five. Of course we've covered this match and, uh, we know what happened. It's one of the biggest shows ever. April 2nd, 1989 Trump Plaza, Atlantic city, New Jersey. Hogan finally beats the macho man for the world title in just under 18 minutes. Where would you rank this you know, Hogan's WrestleMania matches? I mean, I think most people probably have Hogan rock or Hogan Andre as number one or two, depending on whatever is this number three or where would you put this one? I would probably put this at, at number three or four and, and I would put Andre and Hogan first. I would put uh rock and Hogan number two. And then from there I would probably, I would probably give this number three followed by Hogan and warrior number four. It's interesting to me that so many people rank this as one of Hogan's best WrestleMania matches. And they do the same thing a couple of years later for warrior and savage. How much of that is savage and how much of that is Patterson in your opinion? Well, 
I think a lot of it is, is I think 90% of it is savage. That is Randy. You can have the greatest finish. You can have the greatest match laid out in the world. It's up to the performers to go out and deliver it. So I, I give it to savage and Randy was on, he was a big show guy. I did a, a interview this past week where they asked me where Lanny Poffo had made comments about that. Randy always wanted to top that WrestleMania three match. And he had never shared that with me. I, I don't know if, if that's something that, that Lanny hypothesized or not, but in my opinion, I felt that Randy always delivered when he was putting those big matches at WrestleMania. You know, on Tony's show, we, we like to joke about, you know, the greatest night in the history of our sport or whatever. In your wrestling career, you know, cause you weren't there for three, you were there for four, but WrestleMania five is this, you know, cause you're on the show too with, with Roddy Piper and that whole bit. Is this the greatest night in the history of your wrestling career? WrestleMania five up to this point, uh, up until this point, by all means. Yes. Because it for, and that's personal for me because I was a performer at WrestleMania. So it was yes. Hands down. It feels like a missed opportunity, you know, as we leave WrestleMania five, that these guys never headline a WWF pay-per-view again in a singles match. They do that in WCW, but they don't hear. And it feels like it would have been a, you know, an instant money deal because this one was so successful. Why do you think Vince never leaned on that? It, it feels so, sort of weird when, you know, not that long ago we were sold on something being a once in a lifetime match. And then we get the fucking rematch right away with Cena and rock. But this one feels way bigger, at least to me. And we never get it again. Why do you think that was? Well, we also only had four pay-per-views a year at that time. So it wasn't, it wasn't something that you were going to do right away. And we were more in the house show business and the special events were one-offs where the only place that you could see a lot of those matchups was at that particular pay-per-view, be it WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Survivor, or, or the Rumble. We, we tried to make them all different. So there wasn't as much programming from pay-per-view to pay-per-view with the exception of like telling that, that great story with Hogan and Savage on those pay-per-views, but to get to that one big blow off, um, it was just a different way that we did that we book things, and it was a, it was used to primarily build towards the house shows. Well, um, let's talk about the the whole. You know, we said a minute ago about best opponents for Hogan. You know, and, and you told me where you would rank Boss Man. Where would you rank Savage? I put Ray. I, I put Randy in there again. You got you got Andre. Uh, I think was the best rivalry. And I look at it as rivalries. I'm not right. looking at, at match qualities or anything like that, but sure. you've got Andre, you've got Piper, um, Savage. I would probably put up there next because it was such a big deal for the mega powers. You know, I guess that's because I'm a little younger, but to me, the Savage feud was much bigger than Piper. And I know that mm. that's not necessarily the case, but I, I just wasn't around to see it. So you got to throw Orndorff in there too. No, I don't have to. Oh yeah. I, I believe, no, you have I believe to. that you do, but I don't think do you it. have to throw them in there. Those house show matches you were talking about though. And they go all the way across the country, May and June. I mean, all over the place. And then the movie comes out on June 2nd. The movie of course is no holds barred. And we covered this in long form on our Zeus episode. Um, Vince is the executive producer there. And Hulk said that originally Vince wasn't involved, but Vince wanted to get involved and told him that he would pay him the same amount of money that new line was going to. Of course, we know that Hulk's been a little fuzzy on some details. As far as you know, was, was Hogan ever working with a, a contract from someone else? Not to my knowledge from whenever I got involved in it and I wasn't involved in it, but from the, what I knew about it was that it was Vince's movie. Vince was going to produce the movie executive, produce the movie. And they had this script, uh, reworked the script and what have you, but it was Vince's foray into the movie business. 
Um, I remember Vince saying at one point that, you know, the payday that he was going to pay Hulk for it, that Hulk told him, you know, if you lose one penny, I'll, I'll give you everything back. So that that's what I remember about it. Tell me about the way the script was redone. I know we've talked about this before, but Hogan wrote in his book that the script just sucked and the writer just sucked. And of course he's going to get credit for it because as Hulk says, that's how the writer's guild works, but he didn't care who got credit for it. Him and Vince locked themselves in a hotel room in Reddington beach and sat there for three days, 24 hours a day, writing this lame script. Is that the same story you heard? It's probably not far from what they did. I know that Vince, you know, would tear it up and constantly rewrite and constantly redo, uh, Look at how he still produces Monday Night Raw and SmackDown to this day. It's going to go up until he cannot fix it anymore, until he can't <laughs> rewrite it or re-edit it anymore. He is going to continue to tweak it to make it the best that it can be in his in his mind. So that wouldn't shock me if they did that. I think that during those times, he and Hulk were working together on a lot of things creatively, and I, I could see him doing that they have any um any help becoming creative in the hotel uh, room for three days 24 hours a day uh well you know i would probably say that at least six of those hours for those three days were in the gym so okay of course this movie comes out under the shane distribution company you can guess why we know that Rip Thomas is the character Hulk Hogan's going to play and we know that his nemesis is going to be Zeus the villain but uh, Hulk writing his book. We had to write the final scene between my character and Zeus, the guy we set up as the villain, but it wasn't happening though. No matter how hard we worked at it, we just couldn't get it right. So I told Vince, the hell with it. I've got to go to the can. I got to take a shit, brother. Do Dookie. I was so tired that as soon as my ass hit the seat, my eyes closed and I started daydreaming. And in my daydream, the whole fight scene was playing itself out. And you know what? It was great. All of a sudden I started yelling. I got it. I got it. I ran out of the bathroom and told Vince how I was going to go down from Zeus coming into the ring to his attacking me and ripping the ring post in half to trying to use it as a sword against me. I told him to write as fast as he could. We didn't have a tape recorder or anything. So Vince just scribbled down everything I said. Now I want you to imagine for a minute. This is tremendous. Your star, 300 and some odd pound, tan, platinum, blonde, Hulk Hogan, announces to the cast and crew, I've got to go to the can. And then he runs out of the toilet after he had a daydream on the toilet, yelling, I got it. I got it. Hypothetically, what might that have sounded like, Bruce? Well, brother, let me tell you something. Uh, when Okamelia is running wild in you, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> somehow Macho Man got in there. <laughs> brother, I got it. I'm gonna help you come up with the finish <laughs> for this fucking movie, brother. Uh huh. Get that shit out, uh huh, because we need a finish. I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. What if? And then, brother, I said, "Hey, dude." <laughs> you know, I don't start daydreaming until like I hit the, hit the wash on the bidet thing. And then it's kind of gets up in there. And then I start daydreaming. It's, it's, uh, I don't know how you can close your eyes and daydream like before you get to the shitty part. Before you get to the shitty part. What? It's amazing. Ah. <sighs> So well, let me tell you something, brother. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, I don't know. And they kind of run together. Oh, uh, fuck. So we've talked about Zeus in great detail in our archives, but let's skip to the movie just for a second. The budget's like 8 million bucks, according to Hulk Hogan in the book. That seems really high to me. What say you? It was not $8 million. I think it was closer to around four. They, you know, this was, I, I tell you, you know, what the, the, my best memory, and I don't know if we did cover this in No Holds Barred, but my, my biggest memory of this was Vince had me do the premiere for the movie, the world premiere, and uh, big red carpet for the premiere of the movie and all that bullshit, world premiere. Did it at a 
theater in uh, Stamford, Connecticut. Yeah, we talked about it, but tell it again. Oh, but but I I had no I had no clue what the fuck I was doing, man. I'm, I, at this point, I'm what 25 years old, and uh, 25, 26, and and just absolutely clueless. But got through it, you know, and had all these the the stars from the movie. The only one we didn't have Joan Severance, and I really wanted to meet her. She was she was pretty hot. That was his girlfriend in the movie. But it was it was just different, and I just remember being clueless but getting through it. And Vince looking at me, well, goddamn, you do this, and okay, I did it. Davies at number two behind Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It made almost five million dollars in ticket sales. Uh, what's the mood when, when you get the report that it's number two behind Indiana Jones and it drags in like almost 5 million bucks. Uh, <laughs> for those of us look for, for those of us that were in the office and that were a part of it, you, you watch it and you see it from its inception and we were watching the rough cuts and, and all that other bullshit Man, it it was pretty neat to be a part of a movie. So it it could have done $2 million. I think we all would have been happy and and pleased to just be in that arena. So I think everybody was pretty happy with that. I think it winds up making like 16 million and change in the end. Do you think Vince was pleased with that? Did it meet expectations? I don't know if it really met expectations. However, I think at the end of everything when you count the videotape sales and the pay-per-view and then later on the dvd sales they probably ended up making money on the damn thing how run ragged did this schedule make vince mcmahon i ask because you know he's got so much at stake here he's filming the movie he's working out he's barely sleeping but he's also booking wrestling and running this giant company And he's sort of stretching himself pretty thin here. What do you remember about the challenges that presented with him working on the movie so much? For those of us from my end on the television end, um, he didn't miss a beat. So he was accessible all the time. And if he was in the middle of shooting or something, he would call you back pretty quickly. But he was he was totally accessible from my vantage point, didn't miss a beat. And Pat would travel there sometimes and book with him, but he was, he was doing everything else. And and that's kind of the Vince McMahon mode. When we did the XFL, he wasn't going to let the wrestling suffer because he was doing another venture. And that's just the way he is. He's going to find time to give to everybody and everything. If, if he has to suffer and not sleep or do whatever, um, he'll find a way. Let's talk about, Hogan and Vince's relationship when they're making this movie, you know, Hulk would write that they were working together like 18 hour days on set. And then when they were done, they would go train at the uh, gym in Atlanta. And then when they're done at like three in the morning, they'd pop the trunk and have a beer. And these guys spending all this time together. Is this one of those where, you know, this draws them closer together, but eventually it's too much of a good thing. And they just start to really fucking get on each other's nerves. You know, I think that it was to the contrary. I do think it kind of helped get them back to a place where they had been before in like, let's say 84, 83, because during that time, Vince and Hulk spent a lot of time together going over creative and just helping define and make the Hulkamania persona larger than life this was going back to that and getting that closeness again, a uh, funny story that Vince used to tell because he used to love telling it. They were in a convertible on the way to the gym, either on the way to the gym or, or back from the gym and two women pull up next to them and they're like, you know, looking over at them and Vince and Hulk both are in tank tops and got the guns hanging out. And one girl, says to the other girl, she says, I'll take the young one, meaning Vince. And he used to, and he used to just say that to Hulk all the, ha, 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 that's right. They'll take the young one with the hair. And that kind of went up Hulk's ass sideways, but it was a good, nice, healthy, fun ribbing for a while. Hulk says when they finally finished, uh, the quote, little low budget film and took a deep breath, they figured the hard part was over and now it's just sit back and see how much money they make. But 
Then they found out they couldn't get the film in the theaters. They had no idea what was going to happen. And they said they didn't know that this would not be very well received. Apparently they were turned down by a lot of theaters saying, no, we don't want to carry the movie. And Hulk would write that the word on the street was the rumor and innuendo rather that if they played Hulk Hogan's film, if a theater decided to carry this little movie, the big studios, Paramount, United Artists, 20th Century Fox, who give them a hundred movies a year, threatened and said, we're not giving you any of our films anymore. So chat me up here. Was the original plan to sort of pedal this thing out of the trunk before they found the distributor with new line? I believe that the original was to be an independent to produce it independently and distribute it independently. What, what they found was to get to the bulk and the majority of the theaters is that you had to have a major distributor and enter new line cinema who came in and offered to distribute the film. So that, I mean, that's just the, that's Hollywood. (laughs) That's, that's the movie business. If you want major distribution, you need a major distributor. The movie wound up getting a 11% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It has a 35%. Is that good? It's 11%, Bruce. So, like, that's good. Woohoo! 11%. That's better than 10. Or, like, I mean, you get 10%. That's like all of it. And 11, that's like one over. Woohoo! I said, yeah. per- I said percent. Do you know how percents work? Oh, that's that 100 one, right? That's right. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, so that's but, good, right? So you take the 11, you put it over the 100. Hypothetically, if your son Kane came home from high school and tried yeah. to pull the same shit you just tried to pull, what would that be? What did he got an eleven on his test? Yeah. <laughs> Say, <"Woo-hoo!" laughs> good That's job, good. pal. That's good, right? <laughs> hey, honey, it's even better than a ten. Goddamn, pal. Yeah. That did, yeah. Amber Amber said she got a perfect score with a ten. She got a perfect ten. Kane got an 11. Woohoo. <laughs> no, that's, that's, so you're saying that's not good. I'm saying that's not good. Oh, uh, what do they I'm, know? I'm glad you mentioned it because but um, that's all right. Wait a minute. That's rotten tomatoes. So that means that like, if it was, if it was bad, don't overthink it. You're punchy. Okay. The October 13th, 1997 episode of raw is the time that he quoted that thing you said about Hogan. Uh, Vince says, quote, Hogan promised me that if the movie lost money, he was going to return his salary. I guess the check is still in the mail. We said that on raw. Yeah. Apparently October 3rd, 1997. Wow. So chat me up here. <laughs> did, did, do you remember it ever coming up just in casual conversation when y'all are sitting around shooting the shit? This feels like something Bruce Pritchard would have gotten a hold of. And he would have said something like Vince, this idea is going to work. I'm telling you, if this doesn't get over, I'll return my whole annual salary. I can guarantee goddamn tea. I never said that. <laughs> it's like, hey, don't work. It ain't my fault. You just say it. But if it does, can I have a bonus? No. It's amazing. Well, of course, based on the uh, success of the character and because they were so enamored with Zeus, Tony, Tiny, Lister. They decide to bring him in and train him to be a professional wrestler. And we've covered all of that, uh, in our archives, but I mean, hypothetically, this doesn't seem like something they would do today, but then I look around and I wonder, well, I think they would. Yes, would they? They would. in a heartbeat. Hell yeah. They, they'd get so yes. If it was, you think about it, if they went to WWE studios and they had a big, neat, big, mean, nasty monster, that got over and, and looked scary. Hell yeah. I'd put him in the ring. Is there somebody in Hollywood you would pick right now to let them transition to be a wrestler and work a match? Uh, wow. Uh, Hey, there's this guy I saw, uh, in, in this movie skyscraper. His oh, name is Dwayne oh. Johnson. I yeah. think he might, he might be good to get in there. So, <laughs> I tell hey, I gotta tell you a funny story. Funny story when when I hadn't seen Vince in many years, and this was in 2011, January 2011, something like that. And they had gotten Rock to come in and work the deal with Cena. And my son says to me, 
who would have been about 11 years old at the time, 11, 12 years old. He says, wow, dad, I wasn't working for the company at the time. He says, wow, dad, it's pretty cool. Did you hear WWE got Dwayne Johnson to come in and do something for him? He didn't even know who the rock was. And that was just interesting. That time frame. Okay. Next. Well, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. I just went off. You asked me about a star now <laughs> and I'd want to transition into wrestling. I thought of him. Okay. Let's talk about what Hogan wrote in his book. My next film came out of nowhere and started when my agent called up and said, Steven Spielberg wants you in his new movie. It's called gremlins Two: the new batch. It's not a very big part and there's not a lot of money in it, but you're going to work with Spielberg. If I were you, I wouldn't turn it down. I said, I'm there. They told me it'd be two days of filming, just a cameo role. I could handle that. I was going to work with Steven Spielberg. Of course, Spielberg is the guy who made jaws, ET Jurassic park, saving private Ryan, all this stuff. He goes on to say when he gets on set, he sees that the dressing room they had set aside for him was basically a broom closet, which is no big deal. He's just excited to be there and meet Spielberg. So he changes, runs out onto the set, ready to mind his P's and Q's. In fact, let me just read you exactly what he says here. Do the humble bumble double probation routine and not really minding at all, because in a minute I'd be talking to Steven Spielberg. Then I would have a chance to show him. I wasn't just a yelling, screaming, bald headed peroxide, blonde maniac. There was more to me than that. I was hoping he would, he might say, Hey, this guy might have something. Maybe I can make him a transvestite or a bad guy in my next film or a transvestite and a bad guy. Maybe I could stick a couple of bolts in his neck and make him the next terminator. First of all, I love, I love Hulk Hogan, but <laughs> oh. well, let me tell you something, brother. How about you make me a bad guy transvestite with a couple bolts in my neck, and I'll sperminate you, brother. I can do it all. You name it, brother. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah. Thinking, thinking, thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. I want to be a transvestite, brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. But Put one some bolt somewhere. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what's 24 inches, brother, but it's the thermos. <laughs> Hawk said, I went out onto the set and I started looking for Steven Spielberg, but instead of Spielberg, I saw this other guy telling people what to do. I saw him telling the cameraman when to roll and when to cut. And I realized I was with the second unit director. Spielberg was with the stars of the film directing the money scenes. So I went all the way out there and worked on gremlins too, but I never got to meet Steven Spielberg. It was just a carrot. They dangled in front of me. Did you ever talk to him about this whole gremlins Two experience? <laughs> no, never spoke to him specifically about it, but I can, I, man, I, I could see it happening immediately. Like Steven Spielberg, brother. You know, yeah, I could see him pretty excited about pitching being a transvestite bad guy with bolts in his neck. I can see that, yeah. My Wouldn't goodness. you be excited about that? <sighs> I'm glad. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Transvestite. <laughs> Are you okay? I'm, yeah, I'm great. Okay, good. Saturday night's main event. This is a big moment for Tony Schiavone. It's one of his favorite matches ever. Hulk beats the big boss man. And, uh, before the match, Zeus stands on the steps to the ring, not allowing Hogan to enter the ring. And they're staring at each other and Zeus is yelling, move me. Of course, Zeus then kicks Hulk, double punches him to the back. And they left as Hulk lays there. Uh, what you know the, how many times we had to shoot that? Yeah. You've told us that this was something that took multiple shots before. What was it that was so difficult about it? I mean, and what a great visual this was because I fucking love this big blue cage and Zeus confronting him as a kid. This was just everything I needed. Well, it was fucking horrible. And Zeus didn't touch him. He's used to acting and he's used to stunts and stunt men where they don't actually touch or do anything. So he was afraid of hurting Hulk and he was afraid of touching him. So the first time that they went out and did it, he didn't touch him. It was terrible. Uh, we sent him back out again and then we had to do it again the next night just to try and edit and splice all that stuff in. And that's why it's cut the way that it's cut. Well, 
it was still great for me. I know you didn't love it. Saturday night's main event, July 18th, Worcester mass. We get Hulk getting a big win over the honky talk man. Uh, honky talk man was always somebody that Hogan held in high regard. We've talked about honky a little bit, but never talked a whole lot about the relationship with Hulk Hogan. Did these guys ever travel together? You got any good Hogan honky stories you can share with us? No, I, I don't know if they did or not, but I, I've always heard the story about Hulk singing the praises of Wayne Ferris, the honky tonk man, and how he had set Calgary on fire and had this great gimmick. And they originally brought honky tonk man in as a baby face and the audience shit all over him. So instead of, you know, sticking with the baby face gimmick, they wanted to give honky tonk a vote of confidence and they eventually turned him heel because people were booing the living shit out of him anyway. But it was, it was definitely on Hulk's recommendation, recommendation to bring honky in. Coming up, uh, against SummerSlam Hogan and Savage are working in a lot more matches together. And then we get SummerSlam 89 Hogan and Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake, defeat yes. Randy Savage and Zeus Brutus. Headlining the second biggest pay-per-view event of the year. What the fuck? I know you should have been headlining the biggest pay-per-view of the year. In your head, uh, he here's what I fear. Had something disastrous happened to Vince McMahon and he looked to you to help, help sort of steer the ship. Do you realize that WrestleMania six could have been the bushwhackers and Brutus, the fucking barber beefcake in a three-way dance for the world title. Wow. Now we're talking. <laughs> I was ready. Really if ready. only I was really ready in a barbed wire cage. Well, now you're just being ridiculous. I thought you were going to say that's the main event anywhere in the country, which is your normal go-to for any sort of shit match anywhere in the world. No, sorry. Uh, so your memories of this match again, you know, Hogan. He's a baby face doing a bunch of heel shit here, man. He's giving Sherry an atomic drop. And by the way, he did this a lot. He did it in WCW and just several times we saw him give Sherry an atomic drop. Let's talk about the psychology behind that for a minute. Where is an atomic drop supposed to hurt you? In the behind, in your spine, your back and your behind. Okay. Why? Where do you think an atomic drop hurts you? My friends and I have a theory that the atomic drop is supposed to hurt you in the ball meat. No, never. It's like a spine buster. It, it jars your spine and hurts your back and your tailbone. Now reverse. Thank you. Now reverse one might. What, 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 ha what hurts on a reverse? Your testes. Okay. Uh, Tony Schiavone was doing comments. That's your balls. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> Tony Schiavone was doing commentary for this show. Uh, be serious for a minute. Oh, okay. No, I, I know. It's, I know it's hard for you. Cause anytime I say Tony, you're just immediately like, oh, I can't wait to shit on him. How do you think Tony did on this pay-per-view? Okay. You know, uh, folks remember this, mark this so that when people ask you, Hey Conrad, what's that show where Bruce said something nice about Tony Schiavone? This will be it. Okay, Hulk Hogan, 1989, 1990. I thought Tony was a terrific play-by-play -play guy. And I did a good job on this. Uh, I never had a problem with him doing his play-by-play -play stuff. I thought he was good, and um, that's that. What did you think he sucked at? Because you got something you want to say there. It's not a full thought. You qualified it with, I thought. No, I, you know what? No, I thought Tony was, was pretty good at producing. I thought Tony was... Good at play by play. Uh, he's a talented son of a bitch. Not, he, the other thing about Tony, Tony did his homework. So he prepared. He was prepared. You didn't have to prepare for him. He did his prep. He always came prepared. And uh, I thought he was good at what he did. Still is. No doubt. You can hear him Friday nights call MLW. Let's talk about right. the Sherry thing again. You know, we just got so caught up on the atomic drop, but. Physicality against a woman for your lead baby face. Maybe not the best idea. Well, today you sure as hell wouldn't see that, but it was, she's a heel. God damn it. So if, as long as it's a heel, then as long as she struck first and you could retaliate, I think was essentially 
the rationale that people would use back in the day. If she strikes him first, she's a heel, then you can get your retribution. How important was Sherry to, to their matches? Because coming out of this, they work a series of house shows and their cage matches. And I didn't see any of them, but she was there. So I can imagine that she was up and down and all around. Sherry, Sherry Martell was one of the hardest working, uh, man, no matter what her role was in a match, whether she was a valet, whether she was a manager, um, she, she just worked her ass off and she was always entertaining and always trying to, to find a way to make the match better with her involvement. So she was all over the place. She loved to take bumps and she loved to get involved and she enhanced everything that she was a part of. Underrated. I'm uh, sad. She's not with us anymore. Uh, the, uh, first ever UK event in the London arena goes down on October 10th. Hogan beat Savage here to retain chat me up when you guys made a big trip overseas like this, would these have been paid shows? Would you have had local promoters and it's still a WWF show? What was the process for international shows in this era? Well, in this era, we went over there, we were the promoters and we worked with a group, um, that did rock concerts over there. But we were the promoters at that time, and we would go over and we rented the building through them. This particular event, I believe, was something for we did Sky. We did a Sky special that that match was for. And at the same time, we might have done Paris during this run. I'm not really sure, but I definitely remember the the Hulk Randy match was something that we did for Sky. It was a big deal. Uh, here's another big deal. We've got another Saturday night's main event. This one happens on October 31st in Topeka, Kansas. And here the genius beats Hulk Hogan by count out. Of course, the genius was Lanny Poffo brother of Randy Savage, uh, really uses an enhancement talent mostly here, or most famously, at least in my life, Mr. Perfect's manager chat me up about the genius character. Well, you know, you talk about October 31st in Topeka, Kansas, and Vince had a bet that he said that even, you know, the genius would sell out and the genius did sell out against Hulk Hogan on this night in Topeka, Kansas. But the genius gimmick was something, you know, Lanny was the poet laureate of the WWF and he always wrote this great poetry. And sometimes I saw Lanny uh, last week in an appearance and he thanked me because when he did a brother love show. I had given him a call with almost five days notice to let him know he's doing the brother love show. And he could actually put thought into the poem he was going to write. Most of the time he would be given a couple, maybe an hour's notice and Hey, R Lanny, come up with something. But the genius was uh, a Vince McMahon creation that he looked at Lanny and, and the way that Lanny delivered his Poems was kind of holier than thou and smarter than everybody else and thought if he was a genius, he'd be a great, uh, addition to Mr. Perfect. Um, and it was a good, it was a good role and a good run for Lanny Poffo. I, th I thought he pulled it off to perfection. No doubt. I mean, it's a memorable gimmick. I mean, it certainly made an impression on me. What was the relationship like with the boys and Lanny. I mean, it does feel like a lot of people sort of just say, Oh, he's only here because he's Randy's brother. What was the, what was the rap on Lanny and Randy? And just chat me up on that. Randy was definitely the star. I mean, Randy, Randy was the attraction and Lanny, Lanny was a little brother, but I think that for the majority of the career, that was the role that those guys were always in. And I don't know that there was ever any jealousy on Lanny's part. And Randy always kind of took it upon himself to help Lanny in any way that he could and look out for family. One thing about Randy Savage, man, it was all about his family. He didn't fuck with his mom, his dad, and his brother. Um, so I think that guys respected Lanny because Lanny was a hell of a worker. He was a great hand in the ring. They, they were just Randy was the attraction and Lanny was Lanny, but Lanny in the genius role, this was an opportunity for him to step out of the Lanny Poffo role, be a heel 
and really have something, you know, some meat on the bone there. How big of a moment was this for Landy to get a win over Hulk Hogan, even if it was a count out? I mean, it's NBC. It's a big deal, is it not? Oh God, it was, it was absolutely huge. And it meant so much for that gimmick, the genius gimmick, and also Mr. Perfect and gave, gave Lanny that credibility the needed to be with perfect and give him the credibility now to step into that role. After this, of course, Hulk starts working with Mr. Perfect. And I think a lot of people remember that perfect promo where they're smashing the belt. What can you tell us about that? Oh God, it was, I remember it as well. And it was the gum in the belt and every, and everything else when, when perfect went out initially and, and took the, the, the championship there at ringside, it hadn't been done before. And it was, well, I take that back. It had been done before. And the, the model that we were looking at was when superstar Billy Graham had smashed the championship belt of Bob Backlund back in the day and he, he destroyed the belt. And that's kind of where we were going with it was you're going to destroy everything that Hulk Hogan represents. So it was, I thought it was pretty damn cool visual and it was something that the modern day audience hadn't, hadn't seen before. It was awesome. I mean, it left an impression on me. I guess it's worth mentioning that our old friend, uh, belt fan, Dan, for back in the day, he actually owned that belt once he bought it from Mel Phillips for a handful of peanuts. And, uh, it was, he, it, Mel kept it all those years in like a bag, a Ziploc bag of pieces. Isn't it interesting that pieces like that of wrestling history just leak out? Yeah, it's. It, and it's crazy what's out there and it's crazy what people consider, you know, this treasured piece of memorabilia Th- that astonishes me. You don't think on in that bag of, uh, I mean, a belt that was on Saturday night's main event that these guys destroyed for a big angle. You don't think that would be cool to have if I had the whole thing, maybe. No, I mean, he had the leather strap too. I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm not, I guess I'm just not into if it meant something to me maybe it'd be cool but i don't know i'm not i'm not into that per se i enjoy seeing it sometimes when it's i love going through the warehouse and seeing all the different things that they have uh, but it's it's usually in what that piece of memorabilia or what that specific piece meant to me and how i was involved in it well i guess it's worth mentioning that we're going to have a ton of wrestling memorabilia at Starcast, and if you haven't already make your plans to come see us over labor day weekend in chicago while the stage shows may be sold out we've got lots of other unique experiences like wearing a real rick flair robe or holding the actual big gold cutting a promo with tony Schiavone, being the fourth horseman with jj dillon and arn anderson and tully blanchard on what looks like the old tbs set with those blue nwa tags And even some more fun stuff, Bruce. You can sing karaoke with you. There's lots of crazy fun things to do at StarCast. But if you can't make it to Chicago, as long as you pre-order StarCast on Fight by tonight, on August 10th at midnight, you get to save another 20 bucks. All right. If you individually price these shows on like a third-party VOD service, this would be like over $345 worth of stuff. It's 20 shows over four days, over 40 hours of content. But you can get it all right now for $79. Just order tonight by midnight at fight.tv forward slash starcast. That's F I T E dot TV forward slash starcast. And there's two R's in starcast. And not only will you get the exclusive weekend pass, you can watch it live. There's two stages. You can switch back and forth, or you can watch all these shows on demand with unlimited replays forever and ever. Amen. For $79. And you even get a $20 fight credit. Now, All In has just been announced as being on fight. So if you've got some other fight credit, All In could be free. Get half of what All In is going to cost as a credit whenever you spend $79 to join us at fight.tv forward slash StarCast. It's glorious HD anywhere in the world. And Bruce, you and I actually put this technology to the test when we were in Philadelphia a few weeks ago. We used it over 3G wireless, not high-speed internet, not the Wi-Fi, fired it up right on our phones and it was beautiful hd didn't miss a step they've really nailed the technology have they not it's pretty as being there by god check it out fight.tv forward slash starcast f-i-t-e dot tv 
So let's talk about survivor series. This is the next big show we're building towards It's November 23rd, Rosemont horizon in Chicago. Hulk teams up with demolition and Jake, the snake to take on Zeus, Ted DiBiase and the powers of pain. Talk to me a little bit about this. Jake Roberts would tell people years later that he feels like they were trying to take his heat a little bit here because he had always been the guy to carry the snake, but now they wanted everyone to carry a giant snake. And he felt like that sort of took away from his gimmick. What would you say to that assertion that everybody being involved in carrying a giant snake was really taking something away from him? I, I don't see it that way. I looked at it as a pretty cool deal. Unfortunately, it couldn't be pulled off because the snake was so damn big. They couldn't control it. But I thought that the visual that they had in mind with everybody bringing down this monstrous snake and five guys, five huge guys bringing it down. I, the visual of it, I liked. Um, never got to see it because the damn snake was just too rowdy and they couldn't really control it. But uh, hey, Here's my thing, though. If these four guys together couldn't control it, how did Virgil control it all those years? Well, because he's an artiste. Sometimes you just, you know, you learn those things and it's an art form. Okay. I mean, I'll have to take your word for it. I don't know anything about that. So in the survivor series match, we see Zeus eliminated like three minutes in by DQ because he won't stop choking Hulk. Let me guess the quick elimination here for Zeus is to disguise the fact that this motherfucker can't work a lick. Let's get him out of here. Hell yes. Why the hell would you, (laughs) you're not going to risk him touching anybody else. So, okay, Zeus, you get in, choke Hogan, and you're getting the hell out. Slap yourself and go, ah, 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 ah. And he did that. Thank you for that. Of course, we know what's going to go down here. We're going to see um, the sole survivor in the match. Why do you think that would be? Or who do you think that would be? There's only one sole survivor. That would be the Hulkster or Andre the Giant. I want to be, I award you the sole survivor champion of the W uh, tag team. So sole survivor, Hulk Hogan, Hogan must pose. Is that what we're talking about here? Hell yeah. Hogan must pose. Why not? Hulk Hogan's working with uh, Mr. Perfect through the house shows in early December. And then we get to the December 12th, no holds barred the match, the movie, but that's not the way you really say it. Right. Why have a Merry Christmas when you can have a no holds my Christmas, no holds my the match, the movie only on pay per view. <laughs> of course we know what happens there. Hulk and Brutus beat Savage and Zeus in a cage match that was taped right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee at the municipal auditorium. Uh, let's finish out the year 1989 with Mr. Perfect working house shows against Hulk Hogan and Hogan's actually losing all of those by either DQ or count out as we wind up 89 before we cruise on into 90, where would you rank Hogan's 89 up to this point in his career? It's probably better than his 88, not as good as his 87. Or what, what would you say? You know, it, it was good. Uh, some people might even say great. However, I think that it was also reaching that point of, you know, we, we were getting to the top of the cliff, in my opinion, during this time. There started to be some people, there was a little resentment, and I think that people, longtime fans, were starting to say, give me something else. You think that so, it already started here? I really do, Yeah. Well, let's get to 1990. Uh, Hulk is back in his familiar role as world champion. Of course, you may recall he had started, gosh, um, 85, 86, 87 and 88 as champion, but not 89, but we're back in the saddle here at the start of 1990. Where was business overall? You know, business was super hot in 87. It was still doing really well in 88, 89 was phenomenal from a pay-per-view and gate standpoint. As you're cruising into 90, are you starting, is Vince starting to feel some of that? I mean, cause we know what's going to happen in a few months at WrestleMania six. Do you think Vince had his finger on the pulse? So that certain fan who was like, eh, give me something else. I think so. And I, there was also, you had 
the building and, and it was of all of a sudden underneath Hogan, you, you had warrior and warrior was really coming up and people were starting to take notice. Business was good. And it was, there were no signs of, of business going down. I just think that it was the timing of everything where it's like, man, we got to make some changes. We got it. We got to give them something new. And there were some of us, and, and I will count myself in, in this group that thought, you got to turn Hogan heel. I thought that Hulk, you look back at the stuff that he did as a heel early in his career, Hulk is a natural heel. He's a great heel. Vince was absolutely no way. You know, Hulk Hogan's Hulk Hogan. He's a role model. He's, he's a ch- children. He's a hero to children. Can't turn him heel. Let, let me ask you this. I feel like a lot of times... And, and you're going to shit on this, but hear it all the way out before you do so, please. I feel like a lot of times you gravitate towards the creative side of, you know, Hey, well, this would, this would be good. This would get a big reaction. This would get over whatever the word may be, but this would, this would be good creatively. And maybe Vince didn't always think that way. Vince instead looked at, well, goddamn pal. We're making all this on licensing and merchandise and blah, blah, blah. If we pivot, we can't just easily replace that with something. So in theory, yes, your storyline may be better, but it might cost us money. So fuck that. We ain't doing it. Well, I I think that when you go back and you look at, especially with Hulk and you look at the overall business model of, of the company, you had, you had the magazine, you had merchandising and merchandising Hulk Hogan merchandise in particular was a big part of what we did. So Vince was always looking at the bottom line. He was always looking at not just today, but tomorrow, next month, next year, licensing deals that were already in place that weren't going to be realized for six months or a year down the line. So, Action figures, you know, it's it's one of the reasons that back in the day, you couldn't change your look unless there was was approval by the office because an action figure may take six to nine months at that time to produce. So you couldn't change your look because your action figure wouldn't look the same. And, And that was part of the merchandising. So Vince wasn't now as knee jerk, I think, as they are now. And I think that Vince was, was always looking at, you can't just look at it for today. You have to look at what that decision means to business on down the road. So turning Hulk heel, while for me, creatively, I would have loved to have done that. And I, I feel that wrestling, you know, that, that old mentality would have been good business. He didn't. If you would have turned him heel and say Royal Rumble, let's just pretend it happened at Royal Rumble. Who would you have put him against at WrestleMania six ultimate warrior? Okay. But they would have just went in instead of his two baby faces, one, a heel, one, a baby, you know, obviously the two baby face WrestleMania thing is a formula that he wants to move away from. He doesn't try it again until WrestleMania 12 and he didn't try it again for a long time. Do you think that WrestleMania six would have done bigger business had Hogan been a heel? Uh, pay-per-view wise. Yes, I do. Let's talk about, uh, how we're going to get there. Of course, we've got Saturday night's main event, which is where all the big shit happens. And on January 3rd of all places, they're doing a Saturday night's main event in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And reading this now as an adult, I'm so fucking angry that my parents did not take me to see this Hulk Hogan. Do you still hate him to this day for it? I said, I'm angry. I didn't say I hated my parents. Okay. Um, the ultimate warrior teamed with Hulk Hogan to uh, take on Mr. Perfect and the genius. And of course our heroes get the win, but after the match warriors clotheslining both perfect and the genius and Hogan comes into the ring. Warrior turns around and he clotheslines Hogan, knocking him down. Then they sho- shove each other and we're off to the races. Hogan starts working the perfect house shows again. And then we get to the Royal rumble. And this is really one of my favorite moments as a kid, we get the, uh, the first physical confrontation between Hulk and warrior. They're in the ring together at one point and they have a stare down and they're just sort of looking around, checking it out. 
and they're bouncing off the ropes and they crash into each other, but nobody moves after a crisscross Hogan misses a clothesline. Then they clothesline each other. And then barbarian comes in chat me up about the way you guys booked this. Cause you've got two baby faces. Uh, I guess we should mention Hogan comes in at number 25. He eliminates Haku, Jimmy Snuka, and eventually with the help of barbarian and Rick Rude, he gets the warrior out. Um, he also eliminated honky talk man, um, Rick rude. And then with the help of Mr. Perfect, you know, rude's out of there too. And then Mr. Perfect is the last out. So we'll talk about perfect in a minute. First chat me up about the way the whole warrior thing was booked because this is still etched in my brain. Well, I think that it worked perfectly. It was a test and not, it was a, to sample the audience, see what the audience, how they were going to react to these two guys. It's one thing to imagine. It's one thing to announce and get that reaction. But when you actually have physicality, you feel it. The audience wanted it. They wanted to see, man, they had built up Warrior, who was indestructible up until this point, And you had the one and only Hulk Hogan, who's not yet immortal at this point going up against this indestructible object in the ultimate warrior. They wanted it. They wanted to see more. And that's all that we wanted to test in the Royal rumble was, is there an appetite for this? And there was, and that's what we had been feeling all along. And I think that Vince kind of let's test it. Let's make damn sure is, is this what the audience wants to eat? Well, What's the, what's the reaction in the back? You know, I mean, were you watching this in gorilla when, when Vince sees, you know, the reaction to Hogan and warrior, what's he saying? What's he thinking? You know, I, I have no idea. I don't remember that specific moment. I know after the fact that the feeling was, was good. You know, it wasn't a completely different setup back in those days. And it was an overall feeling after the show that, okay, we're on the right track. This, this is money. This is the match. We've got it now. And they didn't, you know, they didn't boo Hogan and they didn't boo warrior. That was important to Vince. Vince didn't want the, the audience to boo either guy. So again, it's hard to, that's, that's the problem with the baby face match though. Eventually you got to pick one or the other. And if you're rooting for one, you're not going to root for the other. So sometimes they're great. Sometimes eh. this one in, in this particular instance, the audience was, was wanting both guys and they wanted to see them collide. Chat me up for a minute about, um, Vince McMahon as a body guy, because it feels like, I mean, according to what we've heard as wrestling fans, that Vince McMahon was a body guy. And while Hogan is really this jacked up, you know, weightlifter, he would even write in his book. When this guy came in, he blew me away. He had been dieting his whole life while I was out drinking and raising hell with the boys from a body standpoint. When, when Vince maybe has his finger on the pulse and thinks, well, maybe they are wanting something new. Hey, if they thought Hogan was big, if they thought Hogan was jacked and a superhero, take a look at this fucking guy. How big of the decision to go with warrior was the diet. And as Vince would say, the vascularity of the ultimate warrior. Well, he definitely had a unique look and that was a look that Vince liked. Vince was a bodybuilder himself. He was a big fan of bodybuilding. He was a big fan of the discipline the, the diet and the training. So that was something that appealed to him and it was larger than life. You know, we used to tell a story with strong men where they would hold two pictures and you'd have superstar Billy Graham in one picture and Paul Anderson, who was the world's strongest man in the other. But if you looked at, looked at Paul, Paul looked like a 350 pound tub of goo compared to superstar Billy Graham, who was stronger. Paul Anderson could lift 10 times the weight that superstar Billy Graham could. Um, it was perception. So the perception looking at the ultimate warrior was here was this guy in this tremendous shape and it had to be powerful. Just look at him, look at the muscles on top of muscles. 
So, yeah, Vince loved that look. And it goes all the way back to superstar Billy Graham and, and those guys that had that kind of discipline. Paul Orndorff and and just it's a discipline. It's It's a way of life. And do you think Vince was enamored with it by comparison? No, I don't know. He was enamored more with it than Hulk because Hulk was still larger than life. Hulk, Hulk was bigger. He was taller. He was bigger. And, you know, I dare say probably more powerful as well. It was just different. It was, it was another look. It was another way to go. Um, they both, you know, they both look great. How much of that do you think was diet? The difference with warrior, between, the difference between the two. Oh God. It's like, it's, it's diet and discipline all the way. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're looking to make some changes in your diet, you can certainly check out our friends over at blueapron.com. You know, Bruce, this is somebody we've been talking about for what feels like forever. These guys have been with us since the beginning. And there's a reason for that, Bruce. It's because you actually love their food. And you're getting that stuff delivered all the damn time. And it's probably because of the chef design recipes, because we know that you're not very creative. You would put the fucking bushwhackers over, uh, but thanks to the blue apron, you've got perfectly portioned farm, fresh ingredients delivered right to your door. And maybe your favorite part, it's quick and easy. Oh yeah. Insanely tasty. What do you like best about blue? Well, apron? I love that every Friday that I'm going to have three meals. <laughs> <laughs> delivered right on my front porch and every single thing that I need to prepare the recipes is in the box. Simple, easy to follow recipes. And I love it. We had the, from master chef. Okay. If you're a master chef fan and you watch the television show, master chef, they had the master chef recipe of the seared steak in cheesy mashed sweet potatoes. Insane. Not only did it taste good, but it was easy to make. And I did the potatoes and my wife did the steak and everything. Yeah, put the brown sugar and the mushrooms and everything on there. But it's great. It comes right to your door. Everything you need is in the box. And I don't know what more I can say because I absolutely love it. I love it so much. You know what I'm going to do? No. If you do this, they're going to. St- Why are you doing this again? Okay. Well, here, here's the deal. Stop it. If you head on over no, Bruce. to blueapron.com right. turn your slash mind. wrestling, turn your you're going to get your first three meals no. absolutely free. Stop it! That's right. Go on over to blueapron.com slash wrestling. You're going to get your first three meals free. Check them out, man. The seared, hey, we, had, we also had the seared chicken and, and tomato no. panzanella. You know what that is? It's Italian bread salad amazing you're gonna love it man it's blueapron.com slash wrestling get your first three meals absolutely free blue apron is a better way to cook conrad bruce you just ran through those ingredients that sounds expensive and if you're on here telling people that they're gonna get it for free these people are never coming back because they're gonna be so annoyed you're ever giving away the damn store man well, I need everybody listening to this Shut to up. please go to blueapron.com slash wrestling Get your first three meals free. Blueapron.com slash wrestling. It's free. You just stop it. it. No, I'm not going to because they get it free and the stuff is amazing. Yeah, it's going to be amazing when they cancel next week. You no, they're not. Everything. You better stop it. Not going to. Free. About- Blueapron.com slash wrestling. I hate you. I hate you back. So let's talk about, um, warrior and Hogan, you know, he's, he being ultimate warrior has been somebody we've talked about before. And has maybe been, I don't know, not always talked about glowingly by you. What was the relationship like prior to WrestleMania six? I mean, you almost never hear anybody say, oh man, warrior was my best friend. So you don't really hear guys talk about how much they enjoy traveling with warrior or training with warrior or being with warrior. But we're about to have a big moment here. What was the relationship like at this point between Hogan and Warrior? I think that I don't, you know, I don't really know. I, I want to say that there was a mutual respect, but also there was probably a little bit of friction because here's the young new guy coming up 
And Hulk knows that uh, Vince is, is going with the new kid. And I think that there was a little bit of of jealousy, a little bit of just um, We'll see, friction. brother. Follow that, yeah. brother. Right. And that's natural. And, I mean, it's competitive. Definitely. And there, there was, you know, the only guy that I ever remember, you talk about people traveling with Warrior. The only guy I, I ever remember Warrior traveling with was Kerry Von Erich. And I, I think Kerry Von Erich uh, was one of the just <laughs> a sweet human being that, that kind of liked everybody. But he that's the only guy I ever remember Warrior traveling with. Why do you think that was? I mean, what do you think it was about Warrior that other guys didn't jive with? I think... Again, Warrior was a unique guy. He had his very strong beliefs. He also was he was very disciplined, and he had to eat certain foods at certain times during the day. He wasn't a big partier. He didn't like to go out and uh, get trashed and drink a whole bunch and not care. He was more concerned with eating his 17th chicken breast and getting his second workout in. So... He was he was a bit of a different animal in in that regard. He was he was very business, and it was all about the bottom line and the dollar. He he wasn't in love with the wrestling business. It wasn't about wow I'm going to go out and have the best match or wow I'm going to go out and, and tear the house down or I really love this because I always wanted to be a wrestler. It was what's my check going to be this week? Is there any sort of you know when Vince is going to go with a guy? We've always heard that he really attaches himself to that guy and really starts to develop a relationship with his champion. Was, was Hogan interested in trying to do any of that with warrior or was it just another day at work? And I'm going to put him over because that's what Vince asked, but this shit ain't going to work. You know, we, we were all asked to help warrior and we did. I think everybody stepped up, you know, Vince was going to help warrior along every single step and keep him from falling on his face. He asked Hogan to help him out. And from what I could see, Hogan did help him out. Savage helped him out. There were a lot of guys. DiBiase helped him out. There were a lot of guys that stepped up to say, hey, Jim, let me help you. The, I think that the main issue was it wasn't necessarily reciprocal, it was, nor was it um, welcome on Warrior's part. It was he, I think he looked at those guys as being jealous of him and trying to sabotage him versus trying to help him. And so as a result, nobody gives a shit or wants to help him. That I think was the end result. So on our way here through uh, the rest of uh, January, Hogan is working with Mr. Perfect. And then he beats Dino Bravo on superstars. And then we're off to the races, man. We've got a main event, February 23rd in Detroit. And this is where Buster Douglas was the referee for Hogan beating Savage. And of course, the torch reported that it was planned to have Hogan and Warrior team up to face off against Dino and Earthquake. But after they announced that Mike Tyson was going to be a guest ref, it was changed to Hogan Savage with Tyson as the ref. And it got a 12.8 rating. Of course, we remember Tyson didn't show here because he lost to Buster Douglas, but he was immediately replaced by Buster Douglas and, um, a 12.8 rating. What a fucking rating. How much of that was attributed to Buster Douglas? Cause it certainly felt like this is the best case of you guys ever striking when the iron was hot because the timing could not have been closer. Could it not? <laughs> well, it, it was, yeah, it was lucky. We, Put that, put that in context for everybody. Cause we've got some younger listeners who don't really remember or know or understand what a worldwide phenomenon Mike Tyson was and how he really was this, you know, what was the old gorilla monsoon, the irresistible force, the immovable object. This dude was indestructible. I mean, he was a phenomenon that we've never seen before. And he gets knocked the fuck out brutally by Buster Douglas in a huge upset, probably the biggest in sports ever. Don't you think? Yeah. I screwed up my weekend. That's for damn sure. 
but I also think that, you know, when you, you talk about the rating and what it was, it also spoke a lot to the Hogan Savage matchup itself and that rivalry being able to come back and put that on NBC, do that kind of a number. And, Mike Tyson, man, he was the hottest commodity on the planet. He really and truly was, man. It, it was indestructible, couldn't be beaten, so much so that we were assured, oh, this is just basically like a, a, a sparring match and, you know, a workout with Buster Douglas. You, you, it's it's a non-entity. It's, it's a non-thing. You know, Mike will be there. Everything will be great. Don't worry about it. So when Mike got knocked out, we're – thinking that we still are going to have Mike Tyson will have his first ever appearance, public appearance live on NBC. Okay. That's still pretty damn attractive. Absolutely. So, so the, you guys didn't necessarily request the change. You're happy to have the first appearance after the loss. You just want Mike Tyson, who is this global attraction, man. We, and, and we were on the phone. We, uh, I wasn't on the phone. I was on the phone with Vince, but, uh, Vince was on the phone with Don King in Tokyo right after the knockout happened and trying to figure out, okay, what the hell are we going to do? So they, they go through this whole thing. I was in Houston. I remember coming home late that night. I was staying at my parents' house and my mom is there waiting on me saying this guy, Kevin keeps calling and says he has to talk to you right away. Well, Kevin Dunn and I had both taken the weekend off. We'd gotten all of our work done. It was this whole Tyson thing was we were, doing these crazy hours. This was going to be our last weekend off before WrestleMania. He had gone to Baltimore. I'd gone to Houston and uh, and Kevin's calling and says he lost. What are we going to do? I said, who's he? What are you talking about? Tyson. He got knocked out. He lost. What are we going to do? Our television had gone out proclaiming Mike Tyson had knocked out or not knocked out Mike Tyson after a, a victory over Buster Douglas in Tokyo this past week. Our television for the next week was gone. Would that be O in it? Help me understand. You didn't know. I mean, they weren't showing the fight at Heartbreakers. Where were you? Well, I uh, wasn't Heartbreakers, but n- nobody cared about Mike Tyson and Buster Douglas. Trying to bust something it, else in there, trying to knock it something was, else it out. Was, it was a non, it was a non-issue, and I called Vince, and Vince picked up the phone. He's like, "Hold on, I got Don King on the other line," and I, I sat there with Vince. Says, "What are we gonna do?" He says, "Where are you?" I says, "I'm in Houston." He says, "Get back." You know, I was on the first flight out in the morning, flying back to New York, and we got all those, uh, all the tapes that we had already sent out. We had to completely re-edit and get get all that stuff out, correcting it. That was expensive and that was a pain in the ass. But how excited are you when that 12.8 comes in? Well, the, the other thing was we, we didn't know if Mike was going to do it. Mike pulled out, I guess on Sunday and said, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Um, and Basil DeVito, who was the vice president of, of promotions and different things and special events, Basil had reached out to Buster Douglas's management. And Basil flew to, I want to say, Buffalo, New York, and met Buster getting off the plane with his manager uh, coming back from Japan and made a deal. And we were able to secure Buster Douglas to come in and take Mike Tyson's place. And not only, you know, it was, we were still going to have the World Heavyweight Boxing Champion. So the man that knocked out Mike Tyson first time, nobody knew who the hell Buster Douglas was, but they knew this son of a bitch had knocked out Mike Tyson. And now he's going to referee Macho Man and Hulk Hogan. It's great shit. It was great shit. So going into WrestleMania, we're going to see Hulk teaming with uh, both the Big Boss Man and Beefcake to be perfect and genius on the house shows. Uh, and there's some big shows along the way. They, they did huge houses in Miami and in Chicago. Uh, Hogan and Boss Man are the tag teams. They take on the Powers of Pain or the Colossal Connection. That gets us to WrestleMania six, which we've covered in our archives. And I know what you're thinking, boy, if I only had a bird dog to help me get all these archive shows together, well, you do just go to something to wrestle.com and they'll be your bird dog, but that's not really the bird dog. We want to talk about today. We want to talk about the support we're getting from bird dogs because bird dogs are gym shorts that are made with a built in silky soft liner. So you don't have to wear underwear. And Bruce, I swear to God, if you wear these things to my house tomorrow, I'm going to kick your ass. 
I'm I'm wearing them right now. Because you know, sometimes look, man. Sometimes underwear can be just a little bit, you know, not all the way comfy, and and, and it's kind of like shoving a loaf of bread into a Dixie cup, if you know what I'm talking about. And I love to wear my bird dogs. I just jump in the pool because I can go from the pool. I can literally walk from the pool into my office. And by about the time that I get ready to sit in my chair, my bird dogs are dry. They dry a whole hell of a lot faster than uh, swim trunks. Tell you that. Well, you know, here's the deal. You got to go check these out. It's birddogs.com. Use that promo code wrestle. And they're even going to throw in a free dad hat. You hear me? A free dad hat. Half Wait off. a minute. Now you're giving away free stuff. That's like a $50 value, dude. Okay. I probably shouldn't have done that, but I think you should check this out just in case it's birddogs.com and you will not take these things off. I promise you. And Bruce, you better promise me you're not taking them off because it says you're not wearing underwear with them. And I need to make sure that if you're not wearing underwear, you're keeping your bird dogs on at my house. Can we make well, the agree? beautiful thing is, is when you're wearing your bird dogs, it's kind of like wearing nothing at all. You're like free and you're good and you're off, but you're also contained whether you're working out, just hanging out, whatever the hell you want to do, man. And uh, I'm going to give you one of them bird dog hats. Yeah. Check it out right now. Go to birddogs.com. Tell them again what the promo code is. The promo code is wrestle. Get you that free dad hat. It's like getting $50, man basically what they're doing but uh birddogs.com you're not gonna want to take these things off i promise you all right so let's talk about what did take off wrestlemania 6 that's the first wrestlemania that takes place outside of the united states it draws 67,678 fans on april 1st 1990 inside the sky dome and uh one of my favorite WrestleMania opens ever because we've got the images of Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan in the galaxy and this tremendous Vince McMahon voiceover. You can guess how it finishes, right, Bruce? The two most powerful forces in the universe, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior, prepare to explode. It's champion versus champion, title for title. It's the ultimate challenge. It's WrestleMania. <laughs> the fuck I was you, drooling during that one. The fuck are you doing? It's time for you to take a nap. Uh, no, I'd like to. I'd like to go, but I gotta. Well, you know. So the lead I up. drooled all over my desk, all over my papers, everything. Look at this. Look at this. It's drool. Do you see that? It's drool. Okay. I know y'all can't see, but I'm holding up a paper. It's got drool. I'm like, Bruce, we're it. doing a fucking podcast. We, we're not on the network anymore. We got kicked off. All right. But I can see you. Yes, but they can't see us. Oh. We went from an audience of millions to an audience of one. That's what, that's what we're doing with our lives now. Okay. I got to, you know, <laughs> this is true. taking longer to dry than your bird dogs do. I'll tell you that right now. The hell. WrestleMania. Wait, can I go now? Okay. So in the lead up to this match, we see warrior have a confrontation with earthquake and earthquake goes to, uh, jump off the second rope and Hogan runs out and knocks earthquake out of the ring. A few weeks later on superstars, Hogan's wrestling earthquake and earthquake hits him with the earthquake splash. Warrior comes out, takes out earthquake. Then he and Hogan have a confrontation. Warrior starts to hit the ropes and Hogan turns his back and starts to leave the ring. Warrior raises his arm. Like he's going to clothesline him from behind. Hogan turns around. They face off again. So it's the first time the two baby faces are going to headline. It's also the first time we've got title versus title. Did you guys have a lot of, or any concern about how this might go over? I mean, obviously you had suggested that, you know, you turn Hogan into the bad guy. Was it ever even discussed that warrior might be the heel here? No, it wasn't. Um, Vince, Vince was steadfast on that and felt that warrior was, was going to be that stone cold baby face, not as in Steve Austin, but that he would be a true blue baby face all the way. You know, the other thing 
in getting into this, I know we got into this argument when we talked about WrestleMania six in the archives was Vince kept stressing to us, you know, God damn it. It's not title for title, but yet everything we did was about, you know, title for title and their continental championship versus WWF championship. Um, and, and when all was said and done, Warrior relinquished the Intercontinental Championship. So it was a little kabuki-ish, to say the least, but it was what it was. Chat me up a little bit here, because I want to talk about the contract signing. And we've talked about this before, but you guys most recently did this at WrestleMania 3. You didn't do it for 4, you didn't do it for 5, but you're bringing it back for 6. Why was it done this way? just something different. And it was, you know, the two biggest stars in the company. It was a huge event to make it a little bit different and just give that importance and make the match even more special. So of course this has one of the, um, the best promos ever, (laughs) you know, the, the actual, uh, the, the rocket ship warrior promo who's producing some of these at the time. Man, this is this is basically Vince here you cut a promo, you cut a promo. And that's what these guys come up with. It wasn't written, it wasn't you know, and then you talk about no. It was what was in that goof's head. Of course that night is a lot like WrestleMania three where we just talked about whether they did the press conference. Well they're also riding a cart to the ring, just like WrestleMania three. Uh, warrior refuses to ride the cart runs down does the normal routine um can you imagine how goofy in hindsight it would have looked to have the ultimate warrior ride the cart to the ring warrior was never going to ride the cart neither one of them were that that was you, everybody else rode the cart and the main event both those guys warrior was going to do his normal entrance running to the ring and hogan was walking to the ring just like he did at, at wrestlemania 3 Chat me up about the way they put this match together, because this is widely regarded as being the ultimate warriors best match ever, you know, this and WrestleMania seven, the next year against uh, Randy Savage. And a lot of people even think this is one of Hogan's best matches. Of course, we know warriors going to get the win after roughly 23 minutes. Hogan misses the leg drop warrior hits him with the splash and gets the clean one, two, three. And it's the first time Hogan had been been clean since like the end of 83 in the WWF, how much credit does Pat Patterson deserve for this one? You know, Pat worked with, with Hogan and warrior and they had started putting this thing together probably about a week or two ahead of time. And everybody, uh, all three guys, well, I'll I'll say four guys because Earl Hebner was a big part of that as well. They put a lot of thought into that match, and and Pat got in the ring with them and worked countless hours putting this thing together so that it would be the match that it turned out to be. Again, you can put together the greatest match in the world. If the talent can't pull it off, it's going to be the drizzling shits. So hats off to, to both Warrior and Hogan for pulling it off and making it what it was. We covered all of this, of course, in our WrestleMania 6 episode in the archives if you'd like to check it out. When it's all said and done, you know, a lot of people were critical of the way Hogan handed over the belt and they say that, you know, maybe he, um, took some of warriors moment, but I guess it was supposed to be a passing of the torch. what do you think about the ending with, with Hogan handing him the belt? Man, I, I thought it was apropos. I thought it was the old champion endorsing the new champion for me. It worked. And I thought that it was. It was good. Who's, you know, who was left in the ring? We wanted to see Hogan right out, you know, defeated at the end. Monsoon had the line, you know, he's immortal. That's where we started. The immortal was right there that night. That one line was definitely fed to Monsoon, um, in the production meeting beforehand. And it, it was that part of it was all laid out. Who pushed the word immortal? Vince. He's a mortal. So it would be bigger than the championship because now he is the immortal Hulk Hogan. What was, um, I mean, Pat Patterson has talked about when he watched the finish of this match, he had went and found Vince and they watched it at a spot in the arena. So fans were around, although they probably didn't know that was Vince and Pat. And he says when Hogan was pinned, they both had tears in their eyes which I've always found sort of fascinating because it insinuates that 
they knew it was like a, a big deal. It was a passing of the torch or, or whatnot. Did it feel that way to you too? And everybody in the company that this was the end of the Hogan era. I mean, not necessarily like he was leaving, but you really were sort of cruising out into like uncharted territory here. I mean, business, not just for the WWF, the wrestling industry had never been hotter than when Hogan was the top guy. And now really for the first time, you're going to deviate, not because he's going to make a movie and build to another big feud, just because you really want to try somebody else as the top guy, not as a substitute necessarily. You just really want to try. Is anybody looking around saying this is a fucking mistake? I think there were talent that felt that way. I know DiBiase felt that way. There were those of us who had expressed our concerns beforehand, but I tell you, I had tears in my eyes watching it because it was an end of an era. Uh, plus I liked Hulk. So I, I was friends with Hulk and I liked Hulk. I, I wasn't that big of a fan of, of warrior personally or professionally. So, so I was probably sad for that too, but you're professional and you move on and you, you do what needs to be done. It was, it was a moment in time that you look at and go, okay, yeah, we're going in a different direction now. You said you knew you, you had tears in your eyes cause you knew Hulk did this. I, I'm not saying this to be funny and I know, you know, some people are going to shit on this, but did it hurt Hogan? I mean, was it, did it hurt his, uh, this is a weird sentence to say, did it hurt his feelings for him to lose the belt? I mean, was this something that really bothered him or was he not selling it? Was he not acknowledging it or. What was the reaction? I think that probably deep down that he felt, hey, man, I, I could still carry it. I can still go on. But at the same time, he was going to be taking some time off in the summer again. And we, we were doing something different. We were trying, trying the warrior in this role right now. So I, I think anybody in that same situation would second guess it and feel, hey, I could still do it. I, I can still get that job done. But there's also a time, man, you got to do what you got to do and it's business. Chat me up. You're saying he wanted to take some, he was taking some time off. Is that because he came to Vince and said, listen, I need to take some time off, spend some more time with the family. Or was it a way that Vince could sort of sell Hogan on? Well, Terry, you've, you've worked your ass off for us. We're, we're going to try this with warrior and, and really we're doing this not because we've lost confidence in you, but how burnout is real and we want you to just take the summer off and you know we'll, we'll put you in a hot angle and bring you back for summer slam so you won't miss any of the big paydays uh, but this will be good for business and good to sort of re help help you recharge your batteries no <laughs> yeah that ain't happening oh uh, vince I don't, I don't see doing that unless hulk wanted the time off he's not going to forgo the number one attraction and take the summer months and say oh take off oh damn We'll, we'll take the hit. You know, yes, I can see him doing that in certain situations. This wasn't one of them. I think this was Hulk was going to do another movie or, or something else was going on during this time that Hulk was taking time. I think this is when, uh, Brooks about to be born. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think you're right. So t tell me though. Um, I mean, cause you sort of poked fun at it there, but realistically, isn't there some wisdom to, you really need to get the old top baby face sort of out of the picture in order for you to push the new top baby face. So people don't try to compare notes and say, Oh, I wish I like him, but he's not as good as, I mean, some of that is, is real, right? Some of that is valid. Yeah, sure. It is. And it, because you don't want to draw the comparisons, but at the same time, you know, that the other one's coming back and those comparisons are going to be drawn in this particular instance, I think you're right. It was right about the time that Hulk was having his first child and wanted to be, be at home more. What was, what was uh, Pat Patterson thinking about this? I mean, Pat had been here, you know, he was in the ring at WrestleMania one. I mean, so he's been a part of all of this with Hogan. I mean, what he, he's seen it all done it all. What, what's his reaction Pat. to we're going with warrior. We're, we're moving away from Hogan. Pat supported it because it's new and, and Pat Patterson has one of the greatest lines that I, I steal from all the time. It's give me something new. And even if it's the shits, at least it's new shit. And it's not the same old shit. So give me something new. And, and Pat was always in favor of 
creating new and doing something new, introducing something new to the audience so that they didn't get tired and worn out on just one thing. That's interesting. Give me something new, even if it's shit, at least it's new shit. Hmm. All right. Hogan has said over the years, he didn't agree with this decision to pass the torch. And, uh, he says after the pay-per-view, he was in the limo and apparently didn't say a word. Were you in the limo after WrestleMania six? What do you remember about that? Well, I don't know why he would be in a limo or where the hell he was going because we stayed in the sky dome hotel and there was an elevator that took you up to your rooms. Well, he might've been trying to find heartbreakers in Toronto. Well, there's some heartbreakers there in Toronto. I'll tell you that. So there's the, the rematch never happens, uh, at least in the WWF. Of course it does happen. Halloween havoc 98. Chat me up. Why did you guys, you know, why did you never try it again? Didn't draw. But even, even as a return, like you don't think you could have done anything differently. Yeah. You could have turned one of them heel and Vince wasn't, wasn't willing to do that. So I I think that the, the pay-per-view numbers were not as good as the previous year. Vince chalked that up to a baby face match. So he wasn't interested in the rematch. Wasn't interested in the return. Hulk wrote Vince McMahon wanted ultimate warrior to beat me for the belt. I didn't agree with him. I didn't think the guy could carry the load. Then again, maybe I didn't give Vince a choice in the matter. By that time, my brain wasn't focused on wrestling the way it should have been seven years of carrying the load as the main guy taking its toll on me. I was tired and I was starting to get hurt a lot. I was beat. I should have told Vince I needed a break. I should have said, I'm sure he would have said, I'm sure. Everyone else had taken time off and I should have looked in the mirror and said, Hey man, you're human. You can only push yourself so far, but instead I kept wrestling and the more it ground me down, the more my attitude started to suck. So when Vince wanted to hand the title to ultimate warrior it was because he could see down the road to a time when he might not be able to depend on Hulkamania and would need to switch gears. I agreed that I would lose the belt to warrior, but I made sure as hell we had a hell of a match. Then it looked like it was just about over. I kicked out of his finish. Then I pinned him and he kicked out of my finish. At the end of the night, the referee was supposed to get the belt from the timekeeper and give it to warrior, but this was my chance to steal back everything he had gotten from me. So I zipped over to the timekeeper, ripped the belt out of his hand. And then I walked on the ring apron with the belt and looked up to God, shook my head. Yes. And then walked in the ring and handed warrior the belt. What do you make of your, your buddy's comments here, Hulk Hogan, that his attitude kind of sucked. Would you say that was a a fair assessment? I mean, you were around him just as much as anybody here. Could you tell a difference, you know, from spring 1990 Hulk Hogan compared to spring 89 Hogan? I think that Hulk during this time was, was looking forward to kind of getting away and, and taking time away. You know, I've heard this version before as far as, and I don't know if Hulk is saying that he came up with it at at that time and that it was instantaneous that he was going to go take the belt and steal his glory. That was something that was laid out ahead of time production. We knew that was going to take place and, and we had it covered to shoot it that way and shoot Hulk all the way on the ride back. So that wasn't something that was spontaneous or, or anything like that or either that or so, um, I just think that Hulk was ready to go away. I think he was looking forward to not taking bumps. I think he was beat up. I think he was looking for time away, but I didn't experience a bad attitude from him at all. A few days later on the third and fourth Hulk would beat earthquake and dark matches on challenge and superstars. And let's fast forward April 13th a rare, and I actually have a picture of this match on my desktop where we're recording this right now, Tokyo, Japan, Hulk Hogan beats Stan Hansen. Chat me up about what you remember about this, uh, world summit of sorts with all Japan, new Japan and the WWF. <laughs> well, the best part about it was that for years, Inoki and Baba new Japan and all Japan had been enemies in, in Japan. Okay. 
they hadn't spoken and had never been seen in public. And then the first together, uh, and then the first time is with Vince in between them and, and all of them shaking hands. It was just a surreal moment for Japanese wrestling. Hulk was a huge deal in Japan and, and Hanson was a big deal in Japan. Hulk trusted Hanson. Um, and they had worked together before. So that was, that was why that match was made. And it was a, it was a huge moment in Japanese wrestling for all Japan and new Japan to work together. That wasn't the original plan though. Was it not? What is that? Well, I thought the rumor and innuendo was that the original plan was, and I could be wrong on this, that it was Terry Gordy and Hulk Hogan, but Gordy refused to do it. So they brought in Hanson instead. That may have been somebody that they had suggested. I think from, and and that may have happened. I don't, I don't really know from my vantage point. It was Hulk wanted to work with Hanson because he trusted Hanson and they had, you know, they had history. So maybe at some point all Japan wanted uh Gordy in there, but let's talk about my favorite brother love show moment as a kid it's may of this year 1990 and during an episode hulk comes out and flips your tie in your face and then you, and then you introduce earthquake and earthquake had some awesome music and um he didn't come out but his manager jimmy hart did i'll let you take it from here well his manager came out and hulk grabbed jimmy and it was roughing up Jimmy Hart and from behind he gets attacked by the earthquake and then the earthquake did the earthquake finish on the set with no give no nothing and squashed Hulk Hogan's chest and ribs into the ground it was a great moment but it was one of those people looked at and still remember to this day it's like you remember watching that as a kid and I had somebody come up come up to me in Minnesota, and they were talking about. You remember that time that Earthquake squashed Hulk Hogan on the Brother Love Show? And I was like, "Yeah, I sure as hell do," because it was that great moment that, to me, I compared that to the Big Boss Man angle that we did with Hogan on the Brother Love set and handcuffing him and beating the shit out of him. It was just such a great, great visual. You know, he, he comes in and hits him with the chair from behind after. Us hearing he's gone, sick, can't be here. He's got a sore throat, temperature. And then he squashes him, not once, not twice, but three times. And pulls the cross necklace off of his neck, just like the old accidental pull in the snake pit for WrestleMania 3. This is great stuff, man. Who booked it this way? And what did uh, Hogan think about working with uh, Earthquake? Because I think a lot of people, and we're going to talk about him in a minute, but I think a lot of people maybe don't know exactly what an athlete John Tenta was and what his background was. Well, it was it was all Vincent Pat, you know, coming up with that angle, but it was somebody that Hogan wanted to work with because Earthquake fit that mold of the big nasty heel for Hogan to slay, the big dragon for him to slay. And John Tenta was somebody, he was a sumo wrestler that had gone through the sumo dojo in Japan, which I don't care who you are, is, is probably one of the most grueling things that any athlete could ever go through. Tenta lived over there. He was a legit uh, amateur wrestler, legit sumo, as tough as they come. If he didn't want to be moved, he wasn't going to be moved but he was also a damn good worker and he was easy. But when you look at them size wise and you match up Hogan and earthquake, you believed that earthquake would do some damage to Hulk Hogan. So it was, and he was easy to get up off his feet. It was a natural Hogan loved working with him and they made a lot of money together. The other thing, man, about earthquake was he looked like he was much older than he was. No, he's one of those guys. He's like JJ Dillon and Aaron Anderson. He looked 50 when he was 30. Right. And, and I, I want to say that, uh, Tenta was only Tenta was still in his twenties here and he was going bald. He had that big beard, but he, he looked like a, yeah, like you say, he looked like a 50 year old man. It's crazy to think about how young some of these guys were, but you're exactly right. He was born in uh 63. So, I mean, this, this is not an old man here. 
No, but he looked like it. He looked like a, you know, he looked like a seasoned old wily veteran, man. And you believed him when he did his stuff because he laid it in, but it was, he was really light as a feather. I, I, you mentioned a minute ago, um, that he was an amateur wrestler. He's a freestyle wrestler, Canadian junior champion in 81 scholarship to LSU where he wrestled, played football there too. Goes to Japan to be a sumo in 85, wins all of his 24 matches in his eight month career, uh, and is renamed um, Koto, Koto Tenzan. There you go. I knew you were going to do that for me. The Heavenly Mountain Harp. And oh, you knew that part. I did. <laughs> and he said of sumo wrestling, nothing I have ever done, not football, not college wrestling, compares to the kind of physical abuse you inflict on your body in sumo. And of course, he was trained by. Um, giant Baba to be a professional wrestler. And I think a lot of people just look at earthquake and say, Oh, he's a big fat guy. But the reality was dude was a badass. And, uh, I didn't need to know that I needed to know that that fucker killed uh, Hulk and he killed the damn snake. And I needed tugboat. And it was, this is the best of times right here for me and my fandom, man. Uh, he was, he was just a badass. I remember the first night that he was in Vince asked me, he said, uh, Tenta, go down and find out if he can cut a promo. We were in, we might've been in Glens Falls. I walked downstairs into, into the locker room and I went up and introduced myself. I said, Hey John, uh, can you cut a promo? And he immediately stood up and he's like six, seven, six, eight and cut a promo on my ass. It scared the living shit out of me. Now we're the same age, um, but it was, he is a big, imposing son of a gun and cut this great promo. And I remember walking back up to Vince saying, yeah, he can cut a promo. He can talk. He'll be all right. <laughs> Good. We'll put him with Jimmy Hart. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Um, but it was. <laughs> what right. The fuck he can is- cut a promo. Don't- He'll never speak. <laughs> <laughs> Put that one in the back pocket. That is great stuff. Well, let's talk about what happened after the big squash here on TV. The announcers are saying that Hogan's injuries coupled with his WrestleMania six loss to warrior have taken such a big toll on his fighting spirit that Hogan's going to retire and viewers are asked to write letters to Hogan and send postcards asking for his return. And I did this and a lot of people got a postcard sized picture in return, uh, autographed by Hogan. Of course it was pre-signed as a thank you. Oh, come on. Come on. How do you know it's pre-signed? You got any other, any other duplicates that would, I want everybody to post their postcards of Hulk Hogan. And there you go. That's not even the best part. Tugboats on TV telling us we got to get these fucking bracelets. Do you remember this? Yeah. Hulk rules, right? Was it, was it the Hulk rules bracelet? Dude, the tugboat bracelet, like you guys got me like nobody's business on that. Like I really felt like I needed this damn bracelet. It was a friendship bracelet. And I felt like I needed this thing. You did. This is genius of you guys, because one of the reasons you're doing this whole letter writing campaign, tell everybody the business strategy here, mail or mail list. (laughs) A <laughs> mailing list well, so that we can send out all the specials, the WWE catalog for all of the merchandise and the magazine. And whenever we're coming to your town, we can send you notices letting you know that the uh, live event is coming and don't miss it. Hell yeah. It's amazing. I mean, I just love this era of wrestling. On the July 14th superstars, Hulk announces he's going to return at SummerSlam to take on Earthquake. And Hulk starts working both Dino and Earthquake on the house shows as he gets ready for SummerSlam. He's beating Earthquake by DQ in all those matches. uh, And he's pinning Bravo, of course. Let's get to SummerSlam 1990. Hulk Hogan's back, man, and we needed him. It's Philadelphia. And I think this is the time when they did a, um, a brother love like trading card or something for brotherly love, right? Uh, greetings from the city of brother. It was brother love, but then I cross, I added brother Lee love and a beautiful picture of yours truly. Well, cause that's what we needed. We needed pictures of you. Yes. And those are all individually signed. I, I marked out each one of those. 
tugboat was supposed to be in Hulk's corner here, but on August 18th, on that edition of superstars earthquake and Bravo would attack our boy tugboat and injure him and take him out of being in Hulk's corner and big boss man would replace him. Now we've sort of talked about this for WrestleMania seven before chat me up here. Why was the change made? Well, because in between the conception of making chic tugboat and having tugboat Hulk Hogan's best friend and nursing him back to have earth, uh, not earthquake, but tugboat turn heel and become a chic, uh, for the Iraqi war and what have you, uh, Sergeant slaughter became available and started talking to us. So when Sarge came in, it was thought, well, who are you going to have the better match with? And what are, you have a real American hero in GI Joe, Sergeant slaughter that you could program versus a guy that really wasn't getting over so much in tugboat. And if they don't care about him now as a baby face, they sure as hell aren't going to care about him when he turns heel where you had the American hero and Sergeant Slaughter return and turn his back on his country. That's why it was changed. So Hulk gets the win here, but he wins by count out. And I think a lot of people, what the fuck are you doing? I'm, I'm trying to move something that's fucking with my feet. Can we just tape the show and you rearrange your office when we're done? Is that possible? Well, I was, I was trying to move it. So it wouldn't disturb you. Well, you've done it twice now, you fucker. And I'm going to have to answer all the tweets. Cause Lord knows you're not gonna. Well, that's true. Okay. So right, a lot of ahead. people want to know why earthquake didn't just do the J O B here. And I know in high, it's a different business, but if I had to freestyle, a guess it's because you guys were planning to go immediately to a shit ton of house show business with earthquake and Hogan. So if you want the clean finish, you got to pay 20 bucks, pay money for it. Yep. Yeah. Come on out and see it live in your town. So Hogan hits the leg drop on SummerSlam on earthquake, but, uh, Jimmy Hart interferes. Hogan throws him out of the ring, body slams earthquake onto a table at ringside. I think a lot of people forget that ECW ECW. And oh Hogan, yeah. We copied ECW then who said that. Oh, you're implying that with your, no, I didn't chant. I said a lot of people probably forgot that. ECW, I know, the ECW even... stole from us. That's what I was saying, dick fuck. Pay attention to the show and you get done rearranging your goddamn office. ECW didn't even exist in 1990. I know. Okay. Never mind. I'll be glad, I'll be glad when you go to bed. If you show up at my house tomorrow and fucking bird dogs, I'll be mad at you. That's exactly what I'm showing up in. Hogan got back into the ring. <laughs> I swear to God, if I pull into that airport tomorrow and you're there in bird dogs, I'm just going to drive right past you. I'm you are going to love my outfit. I'm not even slowing down. By the way, I'm going to take a picture of you and I'm going to post it on Twitter tomorrow when I pick you up because Bruce travels like a homeless man, like a homeless, not just a homeless man, but like a senile old man. He'll wear like, like those horrible, like it's exactly I, what I'm wearing. Like what are those shitty shoes that. Like Cassio kid has them too. They're like these beach shoes, but you wear yours with ankle socks all the way up to the knee. And then like these dumbass basketball shorts that are like bright orange and then some sort of something to wrestle shirt, but then like a fishing shirt on top, you're wearing it right now. Exactly. I mean, I just nailed it. This is <laughs> it's standard issue. Bruce Richard, like everything on your person has a va total value of $4. But then you've That's got not all, true, though. Then you've got on a gold Rolex with diamond bezel. It's like, this is the most confusing thing ever. Okay. Well, first of all, they're, they're sandal shoes. They're extremely comfortable. And they're snooks. They're very comfortable. You're wearing them in public. And I do wear them in public I, all the time. At the airport. Oh, you better believe it. Ron Funches is embarrassed for you right now. And then, and then, and they're not ankle socks either. They're, no, uh, they're knee socks. No, they're the other kind of socks. They're the, the no show socks. No bullshit. You wear it at my house. You wear that shit. All oh, I've worn, I've worn, I've worn the ankle socks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, but I don't anymore. Now it's all, they're all no shows. You look like fucking Kevin Owens dad at my house. It's ridiculous. I've done that before. Yeah. Oh, well, that's not fair because that was like getting out of dress clothes and still have my dress socks on. No, that's how you get out of the swimming pool. So, okay. 
Oh, like you don't wear socks in the swimming pool. <laughs> so this is Hulk's return after several months away. He doesn't win by pin and the feud sort of ends abruptly, at least the TV version right after this. Were you guys not pleased with the way the match came together? I mean, you do some house show business with it, but you don't just immediately try to build on it anymore on pay-per-view. And as a kid, I thought this was awesome stuff. I needed more of it. Well, we had something high and you, you could have gotten in the house shows. So that's again, the business being different, different model then, but also at the same time, we were concentrating on building a, a heel, a nasty heel in Sergeant Slaughter and rebuilding Hulk to be that all American hero that needed to conquer that Iraqi sympathizing son of a gun. Well, they keep going all the way through survivor series, earthquake and Hogan. And then after, um, the match where he makes his big return here, he adds a fourth demandment. You know, there's the say your prayers, say your prayers, take your vitamins, train. And now the fourth one is believe in yourself. There you go. Um, survivor series, 1990, November 22nd, we see Hulk team up with hacksaw, Jim Duggan, the big boss man and tugboat. Boy, that is a crew right there. That's got WCW 95 all over it. Uh, and they take on earthquake Haku Bravo and barbarian. You know, I just realized with the exception of Dino Bravo, who was murdered every one of these dudes in five years in WCW. That crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's about right. Yeah. You had your dungeon of doom or yeah. 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 And then you had, um, <laughs> what was the, the guardian angel? Cause he's, and I love what oh, Tony, and to, Tony Schiavone would refer to him. He would say this guardian angel, man, he's a big boss, man. <sighs> that was terrible. Oh my God. So, uh, and then, I mean, uh, who, who could, who could forget the fucking shock master, right? Holy shit. Shock ma- Yeah. Shock master. And then the, the shark. Oh, the God. shark with the teeth painted on his, oh, uh, on his beard and shit. Yeah. The worst. Can you believe they made that an action figure? That would be cool. No, actually. it is an action figure. You can get it. That would be cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody you could text him and ask him to, how great would it be for the sake of our story? Can you just tell everyone listening that you're going to, when we're, when we finish recording, you're going to send Vince McMahon a text and ask for the shark action figure to be sent to your house. Yeah. I won't do that. For the purposes of our story. Okay. For the, yeah, sure. Immediately. Okay. Thank you. I'll do, you know what? I'm texting right now. Thank you. See, for a guy who's been in a fake business for 40 years playing pretend, you would think you would know how to pretend theater I don't of the pretend. mind here. No shit. Stop reading your text messages. We're doing a show. <laughs> okay. You can answer that one from him. I got to. Yeah, I get it. Ask for that action figure. No, Conrad said that. Uh, and it's you a- know the address. You used to send checks here. <laughs> <laughs> you used to send checks here. That's so great. Uh, Hulk eliminated Bravo and Barbarian, and the Survivor Series is uh, for this year is the one where the winners of each elimination match meet in the main event. It winds up being three on five. Three baby faces against five heels. Interestingly enough, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, we got that. We know those are two of the baby faces. But the third one, a very peculiar choice. Tito Santana. Arriba. Now there's lot there's been lots of rumor and innuendo over the years that Tito Santana was one of the guys who was considered to be the next torchbearer for you guys. Instead, it winds up being Bret Hart. Were you guys flirting with the idea of Tito being a top guy here at SummerSlam or Survivor Series 90? No. <laughs> no, we weren't. Tito was a good one to add to that because it was unpredictable, and I don't think that people would have picked that. But also at the same time, Tito was at that level. What was it about Tito that Vince really liked? Consistency. He was he was consistent, one of the absolute, uh, best flawless workers I've I've ever seen in the ring and just dependable and consistent. Let's talk a little bit about the actual match itself. Um, on the other side, there's going to be the entire team of the visionaries, Rick Martel, Hercules, Paul Roma, and the warlord. And they team up with Ted DiBiase. This is the only time they did a survivor series like this. Whose idea was it? Why did you never do it again? 
I think it was Vince's idea, and the reason we never did it again was because it made no sense and it sucked. I love you when you can just be honest like that. It made no sense and it sucked. It didn't. It, it, who's to say who teams with who? They're not winning anything. It just, it sucked. I'm not arguing that. Yeah. So, uh, I think we know the deal here. Uh, Hulk eliminates Roma and DiBiase, making himself and the ultimate warrior, the winners and sole survivors. And is, I mean, is this to just have Hulk sprinkle some more Hulk dust on warrior or what's the relationship like here by the end of 1990 between warrior and Hogan? Well, I think it was basically Hulk kind of saying, you know what? Uh, I'm back. I'm the man. <laughs> and, and you want to put us side by side, then I'm going to show you that nothing's going to beat Hulkamania. Hulk winds up working a bunch more house shows against Earthquake to close out in November. Earthquake actually wins all those matches by count out. And then he works Earthquake in a bunch of more singles matches. And then a lot of times teaming up with Tugboat to take on Earthquake and Dino Bravo in tag matches. And they do that through the finish of December of 1990. So that's going to wrap up Hogan 1990. Where would you rank his 90 compared to 89? I mean, I love as much as I love the earthquake deal. If you have to compare no holds barred SummerSlam with Zeus and WrestleMania five against WrestleMania six and SummerSlam 90. I'm probably still going WrestleMania. I'm going 89 as a better year for Hogan. Your thought? Uh, yeah, I'm going to agree with you. 89 was better. And I'll go back to what I said at the end of 89, that there was um, something in the air that they were getting a little tired of things. It was even more evident here that they wanted something new. What did they want? Just something new. And they... I, m more than anything, I think it was change Hulk up a little, either change him up, but I'm getting the same, I'm getting the same three punches, the big leg and the leg drop. Um, I just wanted so they wanted something new. They wanted something different and they were tired of the same old, same old. And it started to, it started to show in 91 as, as time went on, they, they wanted, they wanted new and they wanted different whether it was Hulk turning or um, just somebody else in that role. Let's talk about some of the questions that we got here. Cause this week we got some tremendous questions from some of our readers, but I'll tell you, there's no question about our friends over at bird dogs because they've made gym shorts with a built-in silky soft liner and Bruce loves it. He doesn't have to wear any underwear because underwear can be uncomfortable and it's like your shoulder to shoulder in a mosh pit of a band you don't like, but now with bird dog, you feel like you're catching a light breeze, fully nude. Bruce loves that. And you will too. Tell them what to do, Bruce. Well, head on over to birddogs.com and a promo code Russell. And they're going to throw in a free dad hat. So hats are absolutely awesome. So basically they're giving you like 50 bucks. Try it out. It's birddogs.com and you're not going to take these things off. Nah, that's a promise. So check this out. These are some great questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Can you gonna rapid fire? No, because these are good oh. ones. All right. Kenny wants to know, I've been hearing a lot in various audio podcasts of talk that Hatton Bruiser Brody died in 88. He would have had a run with Hogan that would see the Hulkster go over on him. Even Meltzer has speculated at this too. Was there ever any consideration to bringing Brody in? What say you, Bruce? I'd say it's all rumor and innuendo. Vince was not a fan of Brody's. And I started there in 87 and I never, you know, Brody was... Um, killed in 1988. So uh, in my entire time there, Brody's name was never mentioned. Then how do you know that? In. Then why, okay, it's possibly coming in. Sean Duke wants to know: Were Earthquake or Henning ever pitched to be the one to defeat Hogan at WrestleMania Six? Hennig was pitched as being a, a WWE champion, and Hennig was somebody that we all felt could have carried the championship. Babyface territory, man. Babyface champ. Um, Rufus wants to know, did Hogan take a pay cut after losing the belt when he was on shows that he didn't headline since Macho Man was the champ or did he have a contract that allowed him to have any sort of set salary slash pay-per-view match 
regardless of card slot, since he was indeed Hulk Hogan. I can't think of any show that Hulk Hogan was on that he didn't headline. So I don't, I don't ever remember him being an, an, an also ran in any of those. If, if Hulk was on the card, usually he was the headliner. Mike wants to know in Hulk's promo before his match at WrestleMania six, he says, it doesn't matter whether you win or you lose. It seems odd for him to say that in a promo. And most of his promos were about how Hulkamania would destroy his opponents with no question. Was this something noted by Vince or the boys at the time? It almost seems like sour grapes from Hogan, knowing he was going to drop the belt in a few minutes. You know, I think that's just people want to reading read too much into it. It's, I think that people say that I do believe that Hulk said that to hedge his bet, let people know that I, you know, brother, it's not whether you win or lose. Cause I'm losing tonight. Of course. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you go back and you watch that, it's like when you, you see a movie that's got a big twist at the end and then you go back and watch it and you start to see all the clues. And like, oh, fuck. There it was. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of that in this era to me. Um, Scott Martin, and this is a hilarious question, Scott, and I, I can't wait to hear Bruce's reaction. Were there ever any ideas of Hogan getting an intercontinental title run? You know what the answer to that question is? Absolutely. Uh, no. What do you <laughs> go ahead? What do you mean? You, you weren't considering putting the intercontinental title. I think he could have done a really great job as the intercontinental champion. Yeah. No, no consideration. And is that not, would that not be like wearing your shoes on the wrong feet? Like what that, I mean, you could do it, but what the, why, be the fucking weirdest thing ever Hulk Hogan, yeah. the intercontinental champion, everything about that feels weird. Yes, it does. Uh, but, but I, I know it's shocking, but no, there was never any <laughs> consideration to that. What about cruiserweight? Did y'all ever think about asking him to drop some we, LBs? We asked him if he could drop a few LBs. We could uh, maybe do. Listen, brother, you could be the only cruiserweight champ. Brother, brother, you could do a Hulkarana. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's where you would flip the dude off the top rope, dude. But you wait would a like, minute, bro. Wait a minute, brother. How am I going to get up on the top rope again? With the dude is on the top rope. Yeah. Uh, Jim Ben says, tell us about the cocaine promos of the era. And by the way. I don't want to hear that nobody was doing cocaine back then, because if you watch some of these promos specifically with Hulk Hogan and the macho man, these motherfuckers are flying high or so it looks and obviously different time, different place. Well, it may look that way, but I I can tell you and look you right in the eye and tell you, I never did cocaine with any of them. So no, no, I don't think that you did, but are you going to tell me that cocaine never like made its way into the locker room ever? I'm sure there were a lot of guys doing cocaine again different time different place i don't know i don't know in 1990 that there was because the drug test had already that was something that vince had you know kind of put the put the thumb down on so no cocaine wasn't something that was really rampant at that time pot was john wants to know why not turn hogan heel if y'all saw the crowd turning on him already could that not have kept him in wwe longer i mean i know that i know you said this was your idea here but I think the question is worth asking again. I mean, why didn't you do it later? What was it always? He's a hero to children, even in 91 and 92 and 93. It was, it was that way until Hulk turned heel in WCW, even bringing Hulk back. And Vince felt that he was justified and proven right. When the WWE audience, when Hulk came back in the NWO, the audience cheered him. Right. So it's kind of hard to argue that. No, I agree. I mean, it's hard to argue Vince's point, especially when he comes back. I mean, he's legitimately running people over with 18 wheelers in their chair and they're cheering. <laughs> Woo-hoo! But wait a minute. That's our top baby face. Yeah. Fuck him. <laughs> uh, Society. Chris, Chris wants to know where did the Hulk rules logo come from? Man, uh, actually, I think that was Hulk's idea. I remember Hulk pitching me that idea and telling me all about Hulk rules and he wanted to change up the Hulkamania stuff to Hulk rules and do something new. And he predicted, you know, how big it was going to be. And it was, man. That was <laughs> that was a hell of a campaign. No, no doubt. 
Uh, Brian wants to know when was the first moment Bruce and perhaps Vince thought it was time to change direction. Now you have acknowledged that you thought it was time and you pitched it and got shut down. Do you remember the moment, like the match, the angle, any of that? I just remember the time, the time frame, and that that was like late 1989 that the audience just again was just looking for something new. They just wanted new. Um, Curtis wants to know how many brothers does Hulk have? Lots of brothers, brother. Hilarious question here from Ryan. What were Hogan's shirts made of just regular cotton t-shirts or some sort of rubberish material? Oh my God. Rubberish. You can't tear (laughs) rubber. You can't, if you're Hulk Hogan, you can tear anything. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Chris wants to know, was there ever any thoughts of having Hogan become a double champion, like a world champion and a tag champion? Well, we thought about making him intercontinental champion. One time. <laughs> I was hoping you'd do a callback. Uh, real question here from Eric. How many shirts do you think Hulk has ripped throughout his entire career? Okay. I'll give you a real answer. Probably 5,000. Tom Roth wants to know, do wrestlers ha- r- realize how ridiculous the crisscross is psychology wise? The hell does that mean? That's one of the most logical things that you would do if you were in a fight. Is you would hit the ropes and drop down, and then you'd tackle, and then you'd get it again. <laughs> Makes perfect fucking sense. That uh, is why you people are not successful in your wrestling. And in amateur wrestling, you know the uh, crisscross is probably one of the first things that they teach you is a defense mechanism. What class? What day in wrestling school do they teach you get it again? Fourth. Well, let me just tell you. Get it again is the most Southern wrestling term. I know it's tremendous. Uh, Julian wants to know any cool ribs, uh, the Hulkster pulled on Bruce or any of the guys. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that Hulkster ever really, uh, rib me. He was, he was pretty good to me and, and took good care of me. But, uh, Andrew wants to know what were merchandise sales like for Hogan during this time? It's obvious he was number one, but in comparison to say the Austin era, how close were they or far apart were they to one another in merchandise sales? And before you answer, I guess we should mention that I, I think you should only answer this from a live event standpoint, because you could order Austin stuff for a while online. And you could order it through like QVC and home shopping network. And you guys had achieved much greater licensing through Walmart and things. like. I mean, you could buy wrestling shirts in Walmart and you couldn't do that in Hogan's era. So just from a live event standpoint, like the per head or whatever, what would you say? Um, I'd say they were comparable. You know, Austin obviously blew Hogan away as far as number of shirts sold because of all of that different time different place, but for live event sales. Um, but even then they brought more for Austin (laughs) because they knew, you know, what that was. And for Hogan, it was still at a time when they were experimenting with merchandise sales. But I think if you were to go apples to apples, uh, I bet they would probably be comparable. Man. I'm so glad you explained that because I really do feel like, you know, some people forget that when Hogan was doing a lot of this, it was really pioneering shit. Yes. And so you didn't know how many shirts to buy because you didn't know if people were buying shirts. Like, yes, they were buying shirts, but really Hulkamania was one of the first like mass produced crazy sold shirts. And you didn't know what the appetite was really going to be. I mean, yes, t-shirts and merchandise and photos and gimmick tables had existed, but to the scale that they were about to be, that had never happened before. So it was all sort of unprecedented territory, right? Also, you have to understand as well that for the smaller territories and how we had done merchandise before was you had a merchandise person that hauled that stuff from town to town. Now, when they're running major arenas, you had to drop ship huge quantities of all of your merchandise to an arena where they would then count it all out. And then you would bring a person in, they would count it. 
the arena would sell your merchandise for you. They would take a percentage and settle up with you at the end of the night. So there was sometimes just no way of, of knowing until you're into it. So yeah, it was, it was all new in the mid eighties, but Hulkamania was, man, that was a shirt. Julian asked a great question. Why does Hulk get such a bad reputation among internet wrestling fans? Because he was successful. He was the most successful. He was, he was the most over and, um, he was the man. So it's in vogue to, to hate people that are successful. I think James wants to know what was the point of Hogan winning the title or winning the 90 Royal rumble. He was already champion. He wasn't the champion in 1990, was he? Yeah, he dropped it to Warrior. I I think what James is forgetting here is that this was before you guys had put in the win the Rumble main event and get a title shot for the belt. I think a lot of people assume that's been around forever. It was not the case here. But the real reason Hogan won the Royal Rumble is because Hogan must... Pose, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Uh, Great question here from Tom Wing. Was there ever any discussion after the SummerSlam 89 to turn Brutus Beefcake heel on Hogan? Not there, no. No, and and I think that uh, that Hulk always felt that, say, kind of how Vince viewed Hulk is how Hulk viewed Beefcake. Uh, sexy wife Milf AJ asks, "Do you believe Hulk Hogan ever slept with Miss Elizabeth, and who would win in a shoot fight, Hogan or Savage?" <laughs> uh, no, I don't think he did, and uh, I I don't know. I have no idea who the hell would win. Probably Hogan 2018, if I had to guess. In 2018, uh, yeah, Hogan would definitely win. Savage was a savage son of a gun, though. Uh, Curtis asks, I thought Hogan lost to Warrior the way a champion should. Wonderfully done. I think Hogan was even more popular after losing to Warrior because he had our sympathy. What was Bruce's opinion? Uh, I completely agree with that. I even remember the next night uh, or the next time that we did television and there was concern over man, how are they going to react to Hulk? And I know that Hulk kind of wondered how they were going to react. And Vince, we were standing right there and and Vince said, by God, Terry, they're going to explode because they want you to succeed so bad. They are going to explode when you go out. It will be even bigger than it was before. And I dare say it was. Let's talk about um, Thomas's question, because this is one that, believe it or not, we've gotten a lot. And I don't think we've ever even hinted at who greased up the Hulkster before he went out to the ring. You can do the front of yourself by yourself, but what about the back? Does the WWE employ a greaser in the back? Do the guys grease each other up? And is there anyone who does not like to rub baby oil on other men? Any good stories about men rubbing baby oil on each other? Hey brother, can you help me out here? Just, uh, get the spot on my back Get any dry spot back there. Nah, man, guys helped each other, you know, get, uh, make sure that every spot was covered in their back. They helped a brother out, man. Back you in watch the- my, you, you oil my back, I'll oil yours. Back in the day. This is a real question. I mean, they didn't change the ring apron as often as they do now. So ring mats would get dirty and guys would be bleeding and you needed to make sure that you didn't, you know get ill or catch something. So back in the day, was it not common for younger wrestlers to watch the older wrestlers backs in Japan? It was, I mean, I just think that's interesting. It's a, it's a, a nice little, footnote. I don't know that that practice was really ever done in the States, but in Japan. Yeah. Young boys did. I wasn't going to say that word. Uh, Corey wants to know, was there anyone in the locker room that Hogan refused to work with? Because there's been lots of rumor in you, innuendo, thanks to our buddy, woo, that Hogan flat refused to do anything with Rick Rude. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that before, and I'd never heard that. Joe wants to know, I always notice on every VHS at the end of the credits that Hulk Hogan was trademarked by Marvel Comics Group. Was Vince McMahon paying Marvel a certain amount of money over the years so they could use the name Hulk? And if so, how much was he paying Marvel to do so? I have no idea how much he paid him, but yes, they did license the Hulk name for Marvel. The rumor in innuendo I've heard is half a million a year. Would you say that sounds right? 
God, I don't think it was that much back then, but I, I really, honestly, I, I don't know. Tom wants to know what was Bruce and Conrad's favorite Hulk Hogan match? Not just from this time, but ever. Uh, for me, my favorite, it was WrestleMania three, man. It just was just monumental. I've got a different one. If you count the story, you know, which you don't, I'm sure if he's saying match, I would count WrestleMania five. If you're just saying a match when I was a kid, WrestleMania six, it's not close. That was the biggest ever. But if you're going to go the whole lifetime, man, WrestleMania 18 against the rock, which I know is Cody Rhodes favorite. That's like textbook, crazy crowd. How can you ever beat this? Right. It was great, but, uh, uh, you know, again, just for overall historical, everything about it, WrestleMania three, uh, that one's going to be hard to beat in, in, in our lifetime. Craig Reynolds writes that he wrote one of those letters to Hulk Hogan, wishing him well after earthquake attacked him. And he wrote it all the way from the United kingdom. And he says he was thrilled to receive back a postcard from the Hulkster chat me up. How many do you think that they received real question? When you ran this campaign, send your get well letters to Hulk Hogan. How many do you think came in? Just guess. Dude, I think we, I think we, we did over a hundred thousand, which was a big number for people to actually sit down and write in it's huge, man. That's crazy, dude. Yeah. I, I remember being blown away with them talking about it in the promotion saying, man, <laughs> this worked. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap up this week and let's remind you that next week we've got SummerSlam 1998 coming your way. And next weekend, as you're getting ready to listen to SummerSlam 1998, just before SummerSlam 2018, 20 years later, you can come see Bruce and I next Saturday, Grammar Street theater, brucepritchard.com. 2 p.m. is the start time. You've got plenty of time to come see Bruce and I and then make your way over to see the NXT show. Come join us. Manhattan, New York City. Here we come. BrucePritchard.com is the place to make it happen. And don't forget, you've got until midnight tonight on August 10th to go ahead and pre-order StarCast. Save yourself 20 bucks. It's only $79 right now. It will be $99 tomorrow. But today you get a $20 cheaper and you get a $20 fight credit, which you can use towards all in. You'll get to see the roast of Bruce Pritchard, the Monday Night Wars debate with Bruce. We've got some Spend My Days karaoke with Bruce and Jeff Jarrett. It's going to be the place to be this Labor Day weekend. But you don't have to make your trip to Chicago. You can enjoy it across the pond or anywhere you'd like. Go to fight.tv forward slash StarCast. That's F-I-T-E dot TV forward slash StarCast. There's two R's in StarCast. And we will see you next week right here on Something to Wrestle With. Hey, look, I remembered how to end the show. I think that's I, good. That's I think, an improvement. I think we actually woke up and came alive the longer the show went. Well, you got to say my name now. Oh, Bruce Pritchard. Hey, Something to Wrestle fans, it's your boy Dirty Doc Hendricks here with your Something to Wrestle Slam Jam. Doot, doot, doot. Don't miss next week's show where we talk all about SummerSlam 1998. We were on the highway to hell and everyone was invited. It was hot as shit. Bruce was beefing like a motherfucker, and I still don't think that's a real word, but hey, I'll give it to you, Bruce. Anyway, the biggest match on the card was absolutely... Thanks, Pop. With Howard Finkel defeating Jeff Jarrett. Absolutely not, Fink. Get the hell out of here. The real main event was Stone Cold Steve Austin taking on The Undertaker for the WWE title. You want to talk about it? Goddamn, kid. Why don't you shut the f*** up, too, and let me say some s***. I prepared something real special for your ass. It's coming at you right now. Highway to hell. What? Who was going on highway to hell? I'm a little off key. Shit. I'm blowing up. I can't get those too fast. Highway to hell. It was a highway to hell. Come on, Taker. Why don't you get your ass in there and sing too? I'm not singing, Steve. You're ruining kayfabe for everyone. Why don't you give it a rest? Rest in peace. I know your ass is gimmick. It's overplayed. Tune in next week at something to rest. What we talk about. 
all this shit and more, it's gonna be lit. And also check out the ADCs of wrestling for scorching hot takes on the current product from Andrew David Cox and his boy Matt the Mark, featuring lots of these stupid voices and skits, and that's the bottom line, Cut Stone Cold shit show.